recording. All right, awesome. So I will start presenting, and we're going to do an entire screen. You're, you're just going to present your. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. So I'll just do that. I'll present my entire screen, and we'll do this. This way, I can just sort of click through and show you whatever, and then it doesn't matter what's on the screen behind me because nobody's here to look at it. Um, there's there's several things that we want to take a look at today, just to like make sense of where we are, what's going on, where the world is at, is all important for us to take into account, I think, as we consider what's going on this week. There's, there's in case you haven't seen it, there's lots going on. Um, I spent a lot of this morning trying to explain to my students interesting things about the coronavirus wastewater assessment, which is an interesting thing that's worth us spending just a minute or two to talk about. And so let's do a new tab. Coronavirus, wastewater. Just for the sake of we're all humans in this together, it's important for us to coronavirus wastewater because um, it's an interesting study. It turns out that you can track um, you can track wastewater for RNA deposits of the coronavirus RNA, like DNA, but slightly more primitive is what RNA is. And so it turns out you can do this for wastewater surveillance which is fascinating. They, they show you like how they're doing it, what they're doing, and then all of their different numbers. So you can see the wastewater surveillance. And what I'd like to find is what are their current, the current report. So as we take a look at this, there's lots of, you can see they've got interesting graphs and charts, but it means that New Haven, not only do we know it is in a little bit of a COVID resurgence, we're also able to see that like it's it could it could be a rough one. So, for right now, we asked everybody to be all remote, and Governor Lamont has asked for people to voluntarily try and be home by 10 p.m., which I think is reasonable for us to try and respect. Is worthwhile for us to go after, um, and it's an interesting wrinkle to put into all of this, right? Definitely one that we're going to have to think a little bit about how to respond to. And as we look at the, the broader course, if I hop over to the foundation's fabrication website, if we go to here, there's several units that are worth look at, that we should look at for our units overall. And so we've got several things to unpack here, but if we just zoom in a little bit, try and get ourselves into the mobile view, uh, we can see here that we're, right now we're in metalworking as we sort of roll through these, these are the original order of units, but there's no reason why they have to stay in particularly this order. Like the next one was slated to be DIY biology, but I was just helping JR and Leor move some things into that room, which is very exciting. Uh, but it means that while the room is still being set up, it would not make sense for us to try and get everybody to do that stuff right now. So we're gonna wait a little bit on the DIY biology lab, uh, which brings us to our next couple of units. If we look at units six, seven, and eight, uh, six, seven, eight, and nine, we're in this little slog that's going to switch over from our intro. You can see two through five are all intro units. And so they like introduce you to the space, the spaces of Make Haven where you're doing textiles or metalworking or woodworking, those sorts of things. And then we transition into the start of our digital fabrication portion of the course, which is a big like center section of the course that covers a lot of different things. And so as we think about that and sort of how these fit together, we can do some hopping around because for the short term future, we're just trying to keep the, the census low in Make Haven at any given time, just for the sake of coronavirus considerations. And so we're going to keep going with our metalworking right now, but we have a short-term plan that's a little bit more, uh, may, may give us the ability to socially distance a little bit better over the next little while. So those are important things that we take into account as we move forward through, through the course and looking forward. Uh, after this week, which is our second week of metalworking, then we're going to do ideas and projects, which is going to be based around just like how do you formulate an idea, how do you come up with a plan, some of those things that may make sense for us to do an all remote unit, especially you know, if we get another day or two between now and, now and next week, we'll make better sense of, of where we at and if we need to make a call of maybe an all remote. Uh, it would be possible for me to, in a less savvy way than we can do here, I can probably present from home and record that and do a similar sort of setup. So there's some of that for us to keep into, in mind as we're looking forward. 
Then we've got a couple of units in here that could be almost entirely remote as we do uh, embedded programming. If everybody has an Arduino and a computer access at home, then we could probably do that one completely remote if we needed to. And then 3D design, 3D design, but maybe not the 3D printing part, we could also do with a lot of remote work. So there's some options here as we're looking forward, we're keeping just, I just feel like it's necessary for us to say that we're keeping all of the coronavirus things in mind as we move forward. So we gotta make sure that everybody stays safe, stays healthy, and that's a very important part of doing all of this coursework. Um, but with that, it does, it actually, it falls oddly at the right time. We've got several things that are a little bit more hands off for the next little while. So we can make that pivot will be hopefully relatively smooth and we'll be able to stay largely on course, but we could make a few pivots to, to get us even more in line, depending on what the future is going with. If anything comes up, I would say definitely don't hesitate to reach out. If you, you know, if you're sick, you're taking care of family, whatever the deal is, um, let us know, let us know how to help. If there's anything that we can do to reach out to support, if you want to set up video calls instead of a, a conference, we also may, JR and I were talking about possibly taking the office hours and splitting them so that it's, you know, five people one time, five people another time, just so that it's not as many people in the space all at once, just to try and keep the, the numbers under control. All thinking about coronavirus things and not anything super concrete at the moment, but just trying to look forward to make sure that we're as safe as possible and that we're taking care of things. But as long as Make Haven's open, I think the general thought is that we're gonna try and keep everything moving forward with the course. We're not talking about shutting anything down yet, uh, as long as we don't have to. It'd be great if we didn't. So we're just gonna try and keep, keep going. But if that doesn't work for you personally, you know, if you wanna stay out of the space, we can definitely talk about ways to work through those sorts of things. So basically my big ploy of don't forget to check the news and reach out if you need anything, because we're here to help. Those are, those are the key takeaways. So with that, uh, we've got our metalworking stuff. And so for our metalworking unit, which is all being presented here, in here, lots of you have done several of these badges over the course of the week. And I've really come to love the horizontal bandsaw, and I hope that several of you have as well. There's lots of different fun options for us to consider as we do, and my, my browser's still loading because I'm like at the Wi-Fi limit. There was, this video really dropped uh, over the last maybe day or two, and it's great from Laura Kemp. She, she does a lot of woodworking and metalworking somewhere in Europe, I'm not sure exactly where. And then Ada put in the chat this video that's 18 minutes long, put out by the BBC, and it's a really good way to better understand how metal grains grow and change as you heat and cool metals. So it's a really cool video I would recommend watching. I totally watch it while setting everything up. And then here's another one that also takes a look at grain structures and ball bearings to, to kind of make sense of crystalline structures as you're looking at different things. So as we're rolling through, thinking about what our metalwork is, we've got a few more things that I wanted to talk about. And so we're gonna to spend today talking a little bit more about metal like as a material, thinking about its role um, and how these things work. How do you get uh, these things to bond? We talked, we started yesterday, or not yesterday, a week ago, our conversation about soldering and brazing and welding. And we're gonna go a little bit deeper, but please feel free to interrupt me if you think that I have misspoken, if I have uh, said something that was off. My experiences are often in I have far more experience soldering than either of the other two. So I can talk at pretty great length about that one. The others are still something where I'm, I'm happy to admit that I'm, I'm learning uh, a little bit ahead of you guys, making sure that I've got all those pieces to connect together and I'm trying to make sense of those so we can all make sense of them together. And so there's several of those things that we wanna take into account as we're looking at what's going on. And some of these things we cover, some of them we don't. There's, there's a few videos that are here, but we definitely have some information that will be useful for putting things together. Also, if you haven't yet done it, I'm gonna genuinely recommend that by the end of the week, the thing that you should try is welding because it's just so, it's such an interesting, fascinating process to put on all that welding garb, uh, which you can totally wipe down before you put it on, all that welding stuff, and then bonding some metals together in a permanent way is a really fascinating thing because those two metals become one, you're fusing them together. And so it's a neat process 
to, to make things undergo. It's a neat one to see. That would be my recommendation. If you had sort of a, a week one metalworking project and you're looking for something to fit in that week two, this would be a good one to do. If you still got a long project that's going on, that's totally fine. Uh, it might be worth it to try and get in and get badged or if you, you know, if that's a thing that happens later for welding, that's totally fine also. But with that, um, if you ever wanted to see these notes again and you lose the link, it's definitely right here for slides on metalworking part two. But I'm going to hop in the other way and go in here. So these are our slides. Just taking a look at time. All right, so this is two of two. We're going to cover soldering, brazing, and welding, sort of how that goes together. Then we're going to talk a little bit about, oh, we good? We all good? Okay. And then there's a little bit about tempering, but we're going to really largely, um, the processes for this is going to change a little bit based on the material that you're working with. And I think that there's definitely more to be unpacked there if we were to take a look at the course of it. Then we're going to look at the lathe and milling, just in general, what are those things? Because they're going to be sort of the precursors for where some of our other work is going to go in the future. So it's a good way to look at these traditional lathes and mills to make sense of what a CNC lathe or a CNC mill would be. And we're going to be able to work with CNC mills as we move on through the course. There's a whole unit tied up to, tied into those. Oh, oh I'm moving my camera. We all good? Yeah, we're good. I mean, that can <laughs> yeah. be concluded later. Yep, okay. All right, and then we'll talk about water jet cutting and electroplating. So there's several things that we're going to take a look at as we move through. The first, though, I think it's good for us to tackle this soldering, brazing, welding space. All three have you melting metals to put other metals together, but the amount of melting is definitely different from, from process to process. And so I went and pulled the most authoritative definitions I, I could find, which is to take a look at uh, to take a look at how these all go together. And there's definitely things to take into account. So as as we do, there's definitely more of an in between here than than we may first. Well, we'll just take we'll hop into the first one. So soldering, and there's a lot of words on this page, but for soldering, items are joined together by melting and putting a filler metal a solder into the joint, the filler metal having a lower melting point than the adjoining metal. So soldering, it, and I, I can leave this up for a little bit longer if you'd like to read it. Importantly, I think it says, unlike welding, soldering does not involve melting the work pieces at all. Uh, in embrazing, you also don't melt the work pieces, but brazing, you're closer to the melting point of the base metals. So in soldering and brazing and welding, you need to think a lot about the filler metal and a base, a base metal. So for filler metals, that would be the solder wire. So anybody who's soldered electronics so far, the solder wire itself would be your filler. And then the wires that were connected to your battery packs for a lot of the sewable circuits, those were soldered on. The base metal there would be either the metal on the circuit board or the metal on the wire itself. So soldering is bringing those things together. Can I interject that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, oh, I've okay. got. Does, does everyone else, else read double, double, or is that just me? Uh, all I was going, all I wanted to say is that um, solder in, in like a metal shop uh, with 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 electrical stuff, solder is going to always be like wire. Um, but, um, but there's a, there's bunch, a bunch of different, different kinds of solder um, in, uh, like, in a, 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 a metal smithing kind of, yes. uh, uh, situation. And, like, a, a, a lot of it actually is, like, a uh, sheet that you cut, you cut, like, tiny pieces of. Um, so, actually, like, in jewelry, the vast majority of the solder that you use is not a wire. Um, that it's a sheet filler for soldering? Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, you're, I mean, you're still, still you're, you're using, like, using like a tiny, tiny piece, piece of it, of but it, you're a lot of times like hammering it, it flattening it, it, cutting it, it and positioning it, it um, in, in, uh, in a way that you're, you're, you're not, not feeding a wire, wire yes. usually. Yes. Yep. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that really sets soldering apart and so if we're looking at 
soldering as a process. Soldering is very good, and I think this, please let me know if I'm, if I'm off a little bit, because you do soldering for jewelry. Soldering is good at connecting things, and it's also good at filling small gaps. If you have, if you have any of those, you can close up openings with a solder better than you could the other two processes. Um, maybe a little bit of closing a gap with welding, but soldering is really good for making connections, like with a wire and a circuit board, you can close in that gap in between the two by letting the solder come in. And if it's a wire, you're feeding the wire in and it's sort of filling in that way. But I'm the, the plate soldering or the, like the, the sheet of solder would also be, if you're putting it in between the two pieces, it should be closing the gap between them, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, ideally you want to have essentially no, no gap. gap. You, you, you right. know, you, you, you want, want to, that, that gap to be microscopic. Um, um, solder is, uh, uh, so, so, I mean, I mean it, in, in terms in of filling, filling things, things like, like in a in wire, wire or on a circuit board, board when you're not you're really going to see it and the, the, the visuals are not on point, it might be good for filling things, but you would not, not want, want to fill, fill a gap, a gap with solder um, um, if you were, were making jewelry. Um, right. You would you have, have a, a lot of lot trouble of color matching it. It, it would be, be a lot, lot less strong. strong. Um, um, just, just would be, be far more breakable. Right. Um, the, the um, let's see, is this anywhere close to what we're talking about? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, this is more, more similar. similar. Uh, I can go get my torch for one second. Yeah, if you could grab your torch. One of the things that I found when doing my background research for the week, just to make sure that I could clarify, is that there is a fair amount of overlap between soldering and brazing, that those two processes, there, there are pieces about them that are very similar. And so uh, it, it um, I don't know that Ada just ran off and is the authoritative jewelry yeah, soldering yeah. expert, but it sounds oh, yeah. like, Raising and soldering are more similar than either is welding in my mind. Yeah, and so the one of the things about soldering, and in my mind I'm thinking electronic soldering because that's just my experience, is that usually there's just one type of solder. Like you get there's one or two. There's leaded solder and there's unleaded solder, but you don't see a whole lot of different chemistry mixes in the solders. Um, for leaded solder, it's lead and tin, and for unleaded solder, it's usually uh, tin and silver, just a little tiny bit of silver, and then maybe a little bit of gallium. So you've got different metals that are mixed together to make your solders. Uh, and brazing happens in largely the same way, but because your surface is, but when, and we'll see sort of what's the difference and similarity, but I think with soldering and brazing, it's good to think of them as having definitely a squishy boundary, and it's jumping forward, but I, I would Venn diagram them like this that soldering yeah. and brazing have lots and lots of overlap and that maybe there's some brazing welding overlap. I'm even hesitant to put that much. It looks like there's not a lot of connecting those two. Um, what you, what said, you said about, about solder, solder being, being like, like not a lot, lot of kinds of it, uh, uh, that's, that's like, like an electric soldering. An electric thing. soldering, yeah, that's what I'm, yeah. Yeah, yes. But for um, my, I think that jewelry soldering sort of sits in this in-between land mostly where yeah, you've got yeah. lots of different chemistries. It's definitely more structural. Um, yeah. And so you've got pieces that are in play there. So if you've got any, any things to show off, that's the torch that you use for your torch. Yeah. <laughs> that's pretty fun. Um, yeah, it's yeah, not hot enough, enough to graze with. with. Um, it only it gets only up gets to up maybe to about 2,500. 2500. Um, and, yeah, you know, and, you know, and, and it, 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 the heat's pretty, pretty contained. contained. Um, um, so so you, you can't, can't like, like anneal large, large, large pieces, pieces of metal. Actually, metal. I was running, running into, into that issue, issue earlier, earlier today like, when I was just doing some like forming, forming experiments. experiments. Gotcha. So, yeah, we're, so, oh, and, so and the kind, the kind of, of um, oh, oh. Like, like, oh yeah, say, like, Jared, can you make, can you make it a big, um, yeah, and, and you, you can, can see, like, like, little pieces, pieces that, that I cut, I cut off, off of it, it. 
Uh, to... Definitely. Yeah, yeah. It certainly looks thin. Like you'd slide that between two pieces. You're you would not. not no, no, you would, would not, not slide, slide it between things. Because, like, like I said, you want that gap, gap to be like microscopic. Oh, gotcha. At all yep. So you so would, you would have, have it like. like you would like pre flux the pieces, the pieces and you would have them together like with your hand um and then you would position the, the solder like on the scene uh like like right over the seam or uh right under it depending on the geometry of what you're doing mm -hmm. uh, and when the when the solder reaches its, its flow point, it melts and then it flows. When it reaches its flow point, uh, it will follow the heat, and so you can kind of you it, like pull it between between the flux surface and the heat. It wants to uh, flow into that seam, even if it's like microscopic. Gotcha. Yeah. And so just just listening to that, I'm already thinking about this brazing definition. So putting solder into its, its bucket with a fuzzy border, in, in my brain, that's lots of electronics and then maybe pipes, although I would even say that the, the soldering pipes is a bit tricky. Uh, lots of the things that you just said, Ada, ring true to me about brazing, and there's totally an overlap. So I'm, not, I, I'm with you for soldering. I think that probably the naming for these two things is a little uh, tricky, but the big... The big thing that I think is interesting about brazing is that it's a process where metal items are joined together by melting and flowing a filler metal into the joint and the filler having a lower melting point than the adjoining metal. So lots of that sounds like solder. Um, but the, the big piece is that also for brazing, you want to have much more closely fitted parts than soldering and that the filler will flow through and close gaps through capillary action which sounds a lot like what you're saying, Ada, that brazing really uses capillary action as the main mover for how it gets from one place to another, that it needs that as a guiding path as opposed to solder, which is just a little bit more the like dumb heat where it pull, like the solder moves into the direction of where there's heat. Yeah, yeah. no, absolutely. absolutely. I think, I mean, I only, I only like interject to say this stuff because if people want to make Jeweler or yeah. do things like that, you might encounter a lot of soldering, and it is yep. specifically soldering. Um, but like, what you what your what the brazing definition is is uh, a way better encapsulation of that process than the soldering definition. Yeah, that soldering is like low temperature electrical soldering or like. Pipe right. I, I spent a few days this week wondering like how much of this is a definitional distinction more than like an actual difference, right? Like one of them. I think, I think also, also like, like memes that have been passed down for you know hundreds of years, and at some point, like like at some at some point things don't actually match the words that we use for them, but that's just the word. Yeah, no, I, I think that's exactly right. Like I would say that soldering pipes, by the definition that Wikipedia gives, I would say that that's really brazing pipes. Like two copper pipes are fitted, you put flux yeah, in, yeah. and then you heat it up and the, the solder wicks in. Um, yeah. But yeah. just because the way it's been named, we've been using copper pipes for so long that you sort of lose the distinction in those definitions. Well, I, when, you're when you're doing, doing copper, copper pipes, pipes, a lot of times it's not, not called, called soldering, it's called sweating. sweating. And yes. like in, in jewelry, in jewelry uh, uh, sweat soldering is a term, the term that people, people would use, use a lot. lot. Um, that is basically, basically like, like, yeah, not, yeah, yeah. Um, um, if, when you're when soldering two things, things together that have sort of like a, a more surface area. Yeah. Between, uh, between, uh, between between them, rather, rather than, than like, like little, little tiny things, things that you're soldering on, um, um, which is, which a, is a, it, it's a process almost, almost exactly, exactly like, like uh, pipe, pipe sweating. sweating. It's, it's just, just a slightly like different, different, different geometry. geometry. Right, and it, and it's fascinating. Like if you want to go in a deep dive in the history of all this, it's it's a really fascinating thing. There's um, 
like I was given at some point an antique tool from like my great great grandfather that's just like this chunk of metal on a stick with a wooden handle and it's to heat up in a fire so that you can stick it into some lead and then sweat pipes together and I was specific like it's just funny how like those those tools have been around for so long these are actually really old processes and they can get used in all sorts of different interesting ways um, that are that are fascinating and you can absolutely get good at all of them uh, I wonder, I didn't include a picture, it just came up to mind, but um, old uh, pipe sweating tools. If we're pulling up old swipe pipe sweating tools, these guys, this is what I was handed a set of, where it's just like a hot piece of metal that you'd stick into oh, yeah. something and melt it, and then you can use this to get heat to flow in and out. So these are vintage soldering copper pieces where the copper on the end gets really hot, uh, it's probably, actually, now that I'm looking at it, it's probably a real valuable chunk of copper on the end of that tool that's just completely coated in solder, uh, the thing that I have. It's back in Ohio. These, yeah, these, yeah. They, um, they're just for heating up the pipe and putting it together. If you're going to be soldering, sweating, or brazing, however you'd like to define it with a pipe, um, which is a good process to know also for metalworking, you'll often want to get one of these brushes to clean the end of the pipe, and then you cover it with flux, and then you'll solder it with a torch just like this, and a lot like what Ada's showing off for her torch, generally a little bit bigger. The, the one you've got is, I would say, is small, probably just for the ability to control it with your hand. The ones for pipes are usually pretty big and clunky. They're not meant for any sort of fine-tuned movements. Yeah, I yeah, mean, I it's mean, more so that, that, you know, you know my, 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 I don't end up in trouble with my building and things like that. You know? <laughs> yep, absolutely. Yeah. It, it would like, it'd be lovely, lovely to have it in, in a settling porch, porch, but I don't I think, think that, that they would they appreciate, appreciate that. that. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's tough to have, you know, all those things are different building codes that you have to take into account and what are you allowed to have versus what, what's the right tool to have. So those are all interesting, like those are all interesting pieces that I think are worth pursuing when you're looking at these definitional parts. But there's totally, like if you wanted to try and just imagine there's soldering, sweating, and brazing, they all sort of live in this in-between land that are really heavily overlapping and maybe just kiss welding as a process. Um, but if you were to try and put them into neat buckets based on the Wikipedia definition, Soldering will let you bridge a gap and is really good for electronics. And then I think your the jewelry soldering is totally a thing, but you want to make sure that you've got the tiny gaps for wicking, or if you've got lots of surface for sweating, those pieces are all good to take into account when you're thinking about how to do this. Um, and then you've got brazing, which is really, I think, and I should have made this bolded also, that the filler metal flows into the gap when you're doing this. And so it's, Another piece about brazing is that it often wants a, a protective atmosphere. One of the things that we're going to see is that when you have metals in an oxygenated atmosphere, which is what we're in all the time, it's really important for us, you'll start to get chemical reactions with the metal and the air whenever they get hot. And that leads to definite consequences. It's one of the things that you need to consider if you're ever hot tre heat treating your metals is what that does to it, what does that do to the look of it, and how does that process go. So there's several things like that to take into account. Um, but brazing, by the Wikipedia definition, includes uh, the protective atmosphere so that you're limiting the chemical reaction that doesn't, that happens through oxygen. And so flux is often very helpful in isolating it from the atmosphere by just having a little bit of molten gas around the place that's being brazed together. Um, and so you, you've got that. Another piece about brazing is just that it lets you join lots of different materials as long as their melting points are higher than the melting point of the brazing material. But there should, there's lots more brazing mixes. If we look up brazing rods, like if we just hop over here to brazing rods and try and find some of those, there's going to be lots more chemistries of these where you've got uh, brazing rods that you can buy on Amazon, let's say. And so in here, there's tons of different options where you can get aluminum or welding rods. Those are welding brazing rods, welding brazing rods. So there's tons of different 
aluminum zinc brazing rods. Uh, there's many different chemistries of these welding brazing rods that are useful to think about so that you can match or you can pair them with the metals that you're working with. So those are all pieces that have to be taken into account when you're brazing because you need to keep in mind oh, oh, soldering. the what? The same is true for jewelry soldering. So like also if people are doing smaller things, they can look for different chemistry. You know, there's, there's silver solder, copper solder, 14 karat gold solder, 18 karat gold solder, and like, you know, platinum solder. Yeah, I, and I think that all of those, it, it's important to have those different chemistry mixes so that you can match color, which is really important for jewelry. And then also so that you can have the right amount of chemical wetting. Because one other difference as defined here between soldering and brazing is that soldering is largely a surface action that it doesn't penetrate in very much. But brazing by the Wikipedia definition, which I think draws the biggest distinction between the two of definitions you'll find, is that it does have some interaction that's deeper than a surface. So the melted material, if chosen correctly, should intermix a little bit with the hardened material. So it's not like a full blend where the things are all uh, liquefied and connected, but you've got a little bit of interaction that's deeper than just the surface. Whereas solder is a bit more of a surface level connection. Like the, the, the edge of one metal is adjoined to the solder and then the other side of the solder is adjoined to the other metal. Whereas brazing does have a little bit of penetration that goes deeper into the surface to bring those things together. And so you choose, uh, it talks about wetting, if you want to read more about brazing in this context, where you, you choose the right fit so that you get more of that put together. And so here are some examples of what I thought were fitting the brazing definition, although I was hoping to find some others. It's hard to draw a distinction from the one to the other, but these are for, I liked this crack just because it shows that you would have a capillary action. Filling, filling a crack that would be like a microscopic seam like that would be a good place for brazing to work where you'd be able to have it wick in and really fill a super tiny gap. Um, this is another diagram that I found to go along with brazing where you're gonna have your filler metal that would be right there and you can heat up the things and the filler metal would flow and wick right into the joint. You might have a buildup on the one side, but the main thing, and I drew this in down here, the main piece would come from the surface to surface connection that you get and is really solidified by the brazing material filler that goes in between them. Having that on the edge is gonna be an important part, but it's the capillary action, according to the Wikipedia definition, that really makes it happen. So there's, there's several different pieces, but that whole like ecosystem of soldering and brazing is all about melting a material in between to two other materials that don't melt and join them together. It can be useful for electronics and making those connections, and it can be useful for jewelry, it can be useful for if you're brazing together different metals, uh, that aren't the same chemistry. So if you're trying to connect aluminum to other things, you may be able to, like aluminum to copper per se, you might be able to make those connections with a brazing process or a soldering process that doesn't require either of those two to melt. Because I've definitely tried to braze aluminum to aluminum with an aluminum brazing rod and everything just gets mushy, like I said last week. So there's lots of this to take into account. And if you're trying to get metals to join that are different, you'll probably want to look at a soldering or brazing procedure to make that happen. For, and, and then when you're thinking about the two, the reason why electronics are always soldering is that soldering stays at lower temperatures. And I do have some comparison stuff coming up in a minute just to try and make better sense of this. Um, but welding is another process that uses high heat to melt parts together. And so welding, I would say, is definitely different from the other two where it's a, a process where you're melting metals completely and maybe adding a filler, but not even always do you need a filler when you're welding, melting parts together and allowing them to cool, causing them to completely fuse and become one complete part. So when you're welding, you need to be careful about how you're doing this and thinking about the fact that it's a much hotter process. It's why uh, in Makehaven, you don't even need badged to solder. You can walk over to the solder station wearing pretty much whatever protective gear you'd like or, or almost none and melt some metal and use it to join electronics pieces together pretty safely. Uh, I have had a soldering iron in the place where I live 
since college. I think I have one in college. So I've, I've owned a home soldering iron <laughs> continuously. God, that sounds nerdy. But it's, you know, it's good, it's useful. So those are things that you can absolutely do relatively safely in any environment. Um, but welding is definitely something that you need solid protection and, and protective gear for. You, for welding, you're talking about things that are much hotter, so they're glowing hot. Um, you're talking about um, needing to cover the body because if those little pieces of metal come off, you've got lots of, of damage that can happen from having metal that's that hot hitting your body directly making sure that you're wearing the non-synthetic fabrics. Synthetic fabrics are just basically plastics, and so a plastic would melt if something really hot gets to it. I'm sure we've all had our Tupperware melt in the microwave before. Uh, and so you'd have that sort of a thing happen. Most welding is done, welding can be done a number of different ways, but the big thing is that it's using high heat to melt parts together. And so just sorting, sort of seeing how this welding process goes, there's a few different ways that you can do it, but you're, you're joining metal pieces, like these scooped metal pieces and metal plates are joined through welds. You can join rebar through welds, you can do lots of different things while welding. You can even weld underwater, which is fascinating. Of the three, it's the only one that you could do underwater. Um, I had a student last year who was fully committed to the idea that he would be an underwater welder when he grew up. Although, and it pays like, I think it's a six figure salary, but you have to be fantastic at scuba diving and at welding to do them both underwater in limited time frames. So it's a, that's a complicated one, but definitely something we can all aspire to do. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so there's lots of interesting options there, but with welding, you totally need a welding jacket. This can happen either from electric currents, which is what's happening in this example and probably this example. Um, and underwater. So you've got electricity that's involved in all of here, on all of these, and, and really the way the electricity gets something hot is by passing a lot of current through it. And so when you get electricity to be passed through materials, when it's doing that, you're getting sparks and arc gaps. You're getting so much current that it's melting the metals together, and that's the way that you get heat uh, into the joint, is through the electric current passing through the metals at that point where you're trying to weld them which is different, there's some welding that can happen with an oxyacetylene torch, and you need a very high temperature flame in that case, which is then something you can't do underwater because you wouldn't be able to spark your flame underwater, but you can get very high heat flames to melt metals and then bring them together. That sort of welding is one that you can do without any filler metal or without any joining metal, but it needs to, you need to have a, a torch that's going to be able to get hot enough that you can actually bring the metal all the way to its melting point just by the, the torch alone. Typically, you can get electric currents to do that much more effectively, which is why there's so many um, current-based welding processes. Like MIG is probably the one that I would recommend first, but then there's several others that fall into that category or use an electric current passing through the metal in order to make that work. Um, and so it's just a, a happy byproduct that we have all of these different processes for welding metals because metals are always conductive. It's one of their most defining properties. So it's a really neat uh, factor and you can totally MIG weld aluminum. I saw that popped up in the chat at some point. But if you do that, I would completely recommend you talk to Jeffrey, uh, the facilitator. He's great. He's also uh, very adept at using the MIG welder for aluminum, so I would totally recommend that you reach out to him. Even right now, I'm sure that he'd be happy to, to get back with you and show you how to set that up. It's basically the same process as MIG welding, but you need a different uh, filler metal because you need the aluminum to match, and then it runs with slightly different, with different settings. So you'll need to talk to him about how do you do that, what's going on best, and it'd be good, I think, if you got in a session specifically with Jeffrey, because I know that he's welded aluminum. And I've seen his welds. They look like this beautiful one down here in the bottom. Uh, welders, also an important thing about welding is that people who are welders, because it's a whole career on, an, on its own, people who are welders will often be very proud of the way that their welds look. And they want to make sure that their welds look really nice, that they have this steady flow that looks consistent, like it's a little river of metal. Um, when, when I weld, it's never pretty because I'm not spectacular at it. And so I would use something like an angle grinder to clean up my weld so that it doesn't look terrible. There's a lot of benefit to that because you can cover up mistakes pretty easily. But when you do that, you want to be careful for a few reasons if you're using an angle grinder on a weld. One, 
you lose the river look, right? It doesn't look like a nice weld anymore. And a, a serious welder might say, well, then you're not a welder, you're a grinder. In, in very much the same way that textiles, people get defensive about their scissors or you know, woodworkers get, get weird about stains on wood. Uh, welders will say, you need to be a welder, not a grinder. So that they may be a little judgy about that. But the other piece is that if you're gonna grind down your welds, you also need to take into account that if you have like an interior 90 degree weld and you're filling in this little zone right here, that your weld is something that you also wanna take, that you need to make sure that you keep, right? You wanna have that connection between the two metal pieces be nice and strong. So you might actually need to remove a little bit of material so that you can put filler back in and fill that joint. So that when you grind it away, you're not completely removing the material that puts your pieces together. It's a, an interesting artifact, but it's, it's definitely an important part when you're thinking about the structure of your weld. It would, it would not be something that's important if you're trying to build just like a little hobby project or your first weld. But if you're trying to build you know, your own steel structures, then you definitely want to think about if you have enough material there to build your joint. Uh, but again, as a general rule, don't build parachutes, don't build you know, your own bridges, those sorts of things. Those are not good starter projects. Wait, wait until you've done a few things and I'm no longer responsible for you <laughs> to build your bridges and parachutes. So uh, just trying to put this into context for these three processes, we've got soldering and brazing with lots and lots of overlap in those two. And I think that like, like the discussion that Aiden and I just had, um, it's, I think it would probably be fairest to say that there's lots of really old names for those two processes and to try and draw a really clean distinction between them is pretty much impossible. Uh, Cause there's, I think we could go back and forth for a long time and have a spirited discussion about which one is brazing and which one is soldering and what definition do you use is the definition that you're gonna base it on. And having those definitional arguments is a great way to fill time in college, uh, but it doesn't, it does not, you know, get things made. So I think more important than thinking about which definition is which, just that you're melting metals in to join them together and sort of the mechanisms of how that happened is a really interesting thing to take into account. But definitely one of the things that is pretty clear is that soldering is a cooler temperature-wise process than brazing is. So if we're just thinking about these as increasingly hot, soldering would go on the left, brazing would go on the right, and then welding would go way on the right because welding is gonna be much, much hotter Brazing can get close, maybe even like, you know, in, in the ballpark, but welding is where you're completely melting those things to join them together. And so as you're thinking about what you want to try this week, I would definitely say try to get to some welding. You're going to get to do some soldering as we do electronics. So you'll get to play with both ends of the spectrum. And then brazing is a great one to try also just to make the, the full connection, the full gamut of melting metals to join other metals together. So here's a whole, and there's too many words on this slide. I totally, um, I totally concede, and I'm, I'm sorry just from the get-go. But you've got the, a series of questions. So is there, we'll go through these questions one at a time, top to bottom, and try and make a distinction that goes along with each of these. So is there a different base metal filler and, and filler joining metal? So like, you think about the base metal, like if you're putting together copper pipes, which is soldering, sweating, or brazing, however you want to define that, the filler metal would be the, the silvery colored solder that goes into the pipe, and then the copper itself would be the base metal, the part that doesn't melt at all. And so for soldering, you definitely have a different material for your filler than from the base. So the copper is different from the solder, or in the case of a wire or electronics, the, the electronics, the edge of your resistor maybe, or the edge of your switch is different from the solder itself. Um, when you're brazing, they're usually different. You want to have them be usually close in melting points, but not on top of each other. So you're going to have different things uh, pretty much always. You want to make sure that there's a significant difference, a significant but not giant difference in their melting points. So you've got to be careful there. And then for welding, you should have the exact same material as your filler if you even need a filler at all. So if you've got an oxyacetylene torch where you're just melting the metals that are already there, you may not even need a filler. So you, this may be an irrelevant question, but if you're welding steel, if you're MIG welding, 
that line is steel so that it matches directly with the materials that you're putting together. Or in the case of if you want to weld aluminum, that's why you have to switch out the entire MIG welding head and the, and the wire because you want to switch over to the aluminum wire so that your filler is the same metal as what you're welding. So those are totally things that you have to take into account if you're trying to weld versus solder or braze, is what's the filler metal and how does that compare to the metals that are there. And I think that it's interesting uh, to think about the, the soldering, brazing for jewelry, because you often want to have it look the same, but you still want to try and get the lower melting point so that you've got all of those things. It would be interesting, Ada, if you've got, like, for the, for the different solders that exist for jewelry, when they're matched, are, do you know if they're matched for color, but then their composition is slightly different? Like a gold solder? Yeah, yeah. They're, so, they're so they're matched, they're matched for, for, I mean, they're, I mean, they're matched, matched as close as, close as you can, can for, for color. color. And, and um, um, so like, so like a, solder a solder that you would, you would use, use for silver, silver is, also is also going, going to have a lot of silver, silver in it. In it. Um, it's not going to have near, it's, gonna have near, near it's, it's you know, you know it's, it's not, not going to have, have nearly as much as a piece of sterling silver, which is 92.5%. It'll be maybe more like 50. Um, but, uh, yeah, it, it, it'll be a, a different color to match, different colors to match, and, um, usually, um, Different jewelry patterns will come in easy, medium, and hard. <laughs> and um, hard is like the highest melting temperature. So if you have to do a bunch of solder, like if you have to solder a bunch of different things that are reasonably close to each other, if you, if you do them all on easy, then they're, they're, they're all going to start to open up every time you do another one. Yeah. Um, so, so uh, there's, there's hard, hard, medium, and easy. And, and depending, depending on the on chemical, chemical formulation, it's got different melting, melting and flow temperatures. temperatures. I, but, but they're, they're usually, usually all, they're pretty much all above 1,000 degrees. degrees. Yeah. yeah. Fahrenheit. Fahrenheit. And usually, uh, like, like 11, 11 12, 12 maybe. maybe sure which um, is and solder is like in the 750s if it's unleaded and it's like 650 if it's got lead in it yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. So, that's so that's like, like very, very low, low temperature, temperature. Um, yeah and and and, and, and uh, uh more broadly like, like solder, solder is often classed into two, two uh, uh categories, categories which is low temperature, temperature which is like, like electrical, electrical solder, solder and high temperature solder which is Jewelry, jewelry sort of yep. stuff. Yep. Um, um, you know, you know it's, it's, it really it falls, it falls into, into the brazing, brazing definition. Uh, yeah. By, by you know by, you know, by that. Well, uh, if you're using you're sort, sort of categorization. Yeah, and that's that's just if you're trying to categorize, which is actually something I'm really not a fan of. Categorizing in general has gotten lots of humans into lots of trouble. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so just broadly speaking, it's only useful if you're trying to like draw distinctions, but I think it's better to think about it as one big mushy world together uh, where these processes definitely overlap. So, I mean, it's, it, it's basically the same as bracing. I mean, I remember when I was learning to do like oxyacetyl and welding and brazing, uh, welding was like, just felt so alien to me at first because it is, it is just, just so, so fundamentally, fundamentally different, different a process. process. Yeah. Um, whereas, whereas, whereas brazing felt just, just like, like soldering, only a few hundred degrees hotter. Yep. Uh, and importantly, for the low temperature solder, that's actually super important for electronics, because if you were to have your solder at 1,100 degrees, most electronics can handle the heat of soldering. Uh, but not even for a long time. So like if, you, if you're soldering different components onto a circuit board, having that low temperature is important because if you're trying to solder on an expensive LED, LEDs are particularly temperature sensitive. If you get them too hot, you can actually kill them just by the heat of soldering. That's not gonna be a problem for the LEDs that we'll use, but there's, you know, like the LEDs that get used in 
um, stadium lighting, right? Those are big, expensive LEDs, and you definitely don't want to add too much heat to destroy those. You have to be careful about making sure your solder joints go in as low temperature as possible. So there's all of those sides and the properties of this. You can go deep into the metallurgy world to try and make complete sense of it. Um, but I think just for our purposes, it's good to have to know that there's the soldering, which is lower temperature stuff. There's higher temperature soldering and brazing, and those three things all sort of fit in there with sweating and, and other stuff sort of lumped in there as a group. Um, but if we're sticking, the, the rest of these questions I answer with the broadly Wikipedia definition in mind. And so thinking about what's happening, going to the next question, is the melting point of the filler metal lower than the base metal's melting point? And so yes, for soldering, you often want to maximize the difference, especially for electronics. You want to get those differences as much as possible because high heat could damage the parts. For jewelry, you may want to have this be staggered. That, that was a great example when you talked about easy, medium, and hard um, soldering. I can imagine if you have three joints nearby each other, you'd solder your first one with hard so that it's a higher temp melting point. Your second one would get soldered in with medium, and your third one would get soldered in with easy, just so that you have like three different temperatures, and you're not risking opening up joints as you try and well solder the next things together. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's exactly what you would do. Yeah, and so those are, those are the sorts of things that I think are really important, where you can distinguish based on your melting points sort of what's going on. Uh, and so you wanna, you wanna think about where you land, but brazing, I would say, in general, you're gonna be closer to the base metal's melting point than you would be with low temperature soldering. For those, you really wanna stay away from even getting close to melting or damaging your electronics. Uh, you wanna stay far, far away from melting the base metals. Brazing from time to time, you, you could get close. But for welding, yeah. you're absolutely going to be right on the melting point of the metal because it's this, it should be the same metal. Does that? Yeah, a lot of times, so a, lo a lot of times, like beginning jewelry soldering, um, they'll teach people to like, to like slowly higher piece um, to get it close to the soldering melting point, and then like heat the solder a little more. Um, gotcha. And, and that's actually technically not because it's like a better joint um, or anything. It's, it's because the solder is much closer to the melting point of your metal. Um, and so it's like uh, if, if you're concentrating the heat on that joint, uh, and you know, you're new to it. It's very easy to just melt. Yeah. Which is, which is definitely not, not what you should be going for when trying to make jewelry. Or electronics. Yeah. 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 The, um, so yeah, that's totally a thing to take into account. Um, so we can keep, keep on going. So is the bronze structural? And so is the next question. And so I'm gonna say for electrical things, it's really not a structural joint. When you have electronics on there, and actually it happened during class, I was whacking around the one battery holder and just by you know knocking it against the table a couple of times, I dropped it once or twice. Uh, just through those, the solder, the solder joint fell apart. And for electrical solder, that's totally actually a normal thing. It's part of the reason why you should be delicate with your electronics. A big heavy component like a capacitor could in theory come loose from the circuit board if the solder joints weren't good to start with. Um, it's really not intended to be anything structural, but it, it can do some of that work. There's some beautiful uh, freehand soldering for electronics that has been done, and it might make more sense to do like an LED cube. If you haven't ever seen one of these, they're, they're lots of fun. And so just pulling up images of LED cubes like these. These things that exist, people make these with jigs of uh, with jigs to bend the solder, to bend the LEDs legs. And I think it would make sense for this. this the electrical solder is not quite um, structural enough for, it, it can do this job. If this never ever bears any weight, it can do a little bit of structural joining, but it's not nearly as nice as if you had something that was so, sort of in between. It might be good to think about um, blending the electronic soldering and let's see, open this in a new tab. To blend, to blend electronic soldering 
and jewelry soldering to make these structural but still electrical joints. And so these are interesting things. They're Charlie Plex LEDs that are all connected. It's lots of fun to think about how you, you build those. If you wanted to look more into this, there's videos on how you build these things. And then you can use an Arduino to control all those LEDs and light them up in different ways. Um, but soldering, this is really just holding up LEDs. Electrical solder shouldn't be holding more weight than this. Just like a few LEDs, and there's no way that that weighs a whole pound, all those LEDs together. But for jewelry soldering, it would definitely have some structural pieces. And for brazing, in general, you're talking about a fairly strong bond. So you're, for higher temperature soldering or brazing, there you've definitely got some strength that comes from it. You'd want your jewelry to be relatively stable in case it's being, you know, if you're out dancing in the world, you want it to stay together, right? You want your jewelry to be well built, um, which is strong, but a whole different scale than a welded joint, which is going to be enough that you could build a bridge out of it, right? And so if you're welding, then you have that process where really instead of two pieces that are connected, you've got now one continuous piece of metal where the weld joint brings the two pieces together and it completely closes those gaps and joins them as one piece, as long as you've got a good weld. Um, so that brings us to our next question. Can you fill the gaps between base metal parts? And I think that for soldering, the, the message that you're gonna find, especially as you try your own electrical soldering, is that yes, soldering will easily bridge gaps. It'll flow towards the hottest thing in the area and you can get it to purposefully or accidentally get it to make solder bridges is what we call them. Uh, and they'll easily bridge. We'll, we'll talk about those more when we talk about electronics and soldering for that. Um, but solder will definitely close gaps, whether it's the gap between the wire and the opening, which a few of you saw the past couple of weeks for wearable electronics, or whether it's um, any number of different places. But we'll be able to look at solder bridges, which are usually just short circuits that you don't want to have. Um, whereas brazing and, and soldering or sweating, usually you have a very tight gap. You've got a capillary action that happens that brings the filler into, into the seam. So you've got almost no gap. You're, you're trying to keep that as small as possible so that the filler is blending into the two metals, sort of bringing them together more than uh, filling a void between them, grabbing onto their surfaces. And so for brazing or higher temperature soldering, you're hoping for something like that, where the, the filler blends in, it, it sort of capillary actions it way down into the material, into the seam, so that you've got a connection that's a little bit deeper than the surface level solder. And, and that's got benefits for strength, but it's got concessions in that you can't really, you shouldn't really be closing gaps between materials. So there's definitely some interesting things there. For welding, uh, sure, you can fill a gap with most welding. Uh, you can put in filler material if you've got like a pit or a divot, and there's definitely some people on YouTube that do restoration work, and they'll use uh, welding to fill in voids. If you know something's rusted out, they'll put metal back in place. But if you're doing structural pieces and you're building a bridge, you want your pieces to already be a good fit, and then your weld is just there to make the connection between the two pieces. You're, n you're hopefully not trying to fill in gaps where it doesn't quite fit together. You, you can do that, um, but it's not going to be as strong if the original metal is there. The heat affected zone is something that you need to think about if you're getting deeper and deeper into welding. Uh, what's the heat affected zone? How, how do you keep that big or small? Usually a heat affected zone becomes more brittle. And so you want to avoid letting that expand as much as you can. So if you're filling in voids with your welds, then you're going to have an expanded heat affected zone. And that leads to generally weaker uh, more brittle joints so that when they start to break, cracks can propagate along the whole seam. So you've got to be careful with that as you're doing it. But those are really more high level welding concerns. When you're doing your first weld, just getting it in there is really the big thing. Uh, and when you do that, you'll see that there's definitely more metal than when you started with when you're putting a weld together for your first weld. And so you can totally fill a void that you could grind down later. Uh, so if you've got a, you know, if you're building a table that's going to hold a hundred pounds, and you've got a cut that went poorly, you can totally fill it in and then grind it flat. Um, but again, if you're doing a high stakes thing, bigger than a, than a light use table, you'll want to try and avoid that and have the metal in its original shape fit together nicely. And then 
Another question is how deep is the connection between the filler and the base metal? And so for solder, and especially electronic solder, it is surface level only. And you need to use flux to make sure that the surface is as clean as possible. Lots of electrical solder actually comes with flux down the middle of the solder. It's, it's called a rosin core solder, where there's flux in the solder itself. But you're, as a person who's been soldering for a long time, I will tell you, your life will go better if you add a lot of flux onto the thing. It's gonna chemically clean it so that you're not dealing with any sort of a buildup of oils or with an oxide layer. If it can clean that away for you, that'd be great. The flux will help make sure that your solder knows where it wants to go because it'll try and get the bonds to the clean metals. Uh, but really, soldering is something that happens pretty much at the surface and on the surface. If you have a solder joint ever break, you'll see that it looks like the piece was sort of entrapped a little bit, but not that there's any pieces of it really having left. Uh, so you're, you're really at the surface only when you're soldering, especially low temp soldering for electronics. Whereas when you're brazing, you're hoping for the right chemical combination so that you get some wetting. The flux is still useful. It'll clean the surface. It'll remove oils. It'll remove oxidation, uh, light oxidation. But wetting is, for brazing is something that's special where you get just a little bit deeper interaction where you do get some of the brazing material to mix in just below the surface of the base metal so that you've got a better connection that's a little bit stronger in there. So that's totally something that you'd like to have. And that happens by pairing your uh, brazing metal well with the metals that you're trying to braze together. If you have really dissimilar metals, that might be hard to do, and you might get surface level connections. So you can definitely think about how you want to join those if you want to have any sort of connection geometry that helps hold your structural pieces together. And then the braze would just be to, bet to reinforce that. Um, but those are all pieces that can be taken into account. Um, and this is going to happen more with the capillary action. It'll go down in, it'll, it'll fill in microscopic gaps, and then sort of permeate into the grains just a little bit of the base metal, but not, you know, just, just barely beyond the surface. Uh, and so here's brazing. Oh, I just hit the link. But brazing on Wikipedia is really interesting. Whoa, what's going on? Okay, here we go. And then for welding, how deep is the connection? It is complete. So you've got the entire welded area is bonded and is a bonded connection. That heat affected zone is what we're talking about. And so the whole heat affected zone is a complete connection. And so when you go to do a weld, that's anything that's sort of discolored, that's where your connection is going to be. Is that somebody? Oh, OK. Um, so yeah, a weld is a really a complete connection between two pieces of metal that brings them totally together. It's the most structural and definitely keeps things as, as strong as possible here. But that said, we've talked a lot about those three processes, which will be totally useful. But let's not just stay on that one thing. We've got lots more to cover. So tempering. Tempering uh, is something that's interesting to talk about for sure. And it's something that's absolutely useful to consider. And so I've got this lots of thing that I wrote. I'm just going to read it for the sake of, of being clear. We live in an atmosphere that's 20% oxygen, pretty much, and that oxygen would always like to absorb two electrons per atom. And that, that's really how our metabolism works, which is fascinating, right? You probably all learned in high school that you breathe in oxygen, you breathe out carbon dioxide. Plants breathe in carbon dioxide, and they breathe out oxygen. That sort of metabolism cycle is totally necessary for us. It's how we work. And we're really animal life, which moves around very fast and is exciting is enabled by that high energy chemistry that oxygen is able to give. It's super exciting that we can, you know, we walk around, we think, we talk, we move. Uh, whereas plants, chemistry is more restrained because their chemical reactions just happen slower because carbon dioxide isn't as good at, at getting that piece to go. Um, but it's got, it's got downsides too. That oxygen being out in the atmosphere, a waste product from plants, is also going to react with different metals. And so metals have the ability to move their electrons through them. They're able to conduct electricity, which is a key part of it. And so you get this oxidation that happens on the surface of metals. And we use that, rusting is what, happenings, is what happens a lot of the time, but it's also something that you can see in metals. And so if you heat up a metal and you cool it down, you can get colors that show up on the surface. And I saw Ada and Ruby working on this a little bit last week on Thursday with some copper, and you can totally do it with steel. 
where you can deliberately raise and lower the temperatures. And I, I want, if you're trying to do this, a kiln could be a good option. So there's, there's opportunity for that in the not too distant future. Or maybe if we can figure out how to use one that is already around nearby, that might be possible. But to raise and lower the temperatures of metals, you can get lots of different things to happen. Um, if you do it quickly, if you heat things and you cool things, this has got an interesting and pronounced effect. You can get this color to form. And if you're thinking about machining, which we're going to talk about in a little bit, this can be something that's really helpful for you. Um, because you get these oxide layers that form. And essentially what happens is this is just a thin layer of rust across the surface where that oxygen has interacted with the metal. And so it's a super thin layer. And so what happens with that and why you get the color is because light that comes in, it hits the metal, it bounces through that little rust layer, and only one color is constructively interfered as it comes out. And it's based on the actual geometric thickness of the layer. So you get these different layers of rust that show up based on temperature, but that's based on the depth that the oxygen is able to permeate into the metal and thus the thickness of the semi-transparent rust layer, which is fascinating. The, the big takeaway is that you want the chips on the lathe to be colored blue, because then all of your heat is leaving with the chips and your workpiece should be left in the normal metal color. That's the practical upshot. Uh, the, other, the other side effect here is that when, you've got, when you're looking at your um, sword that's there, the sword has got differently colored edges than it does the center. You want the edges to be nice and hard, and you want the center to be a little bit more flexible. That way the edges stay sharp on a sword, but the, the metal itself can bend and flex just a little bit without letting the, the edges crack. Um, and then up at the top, you've got these blue colored chips that are a little bit rusty on the sides, but that blue color on metal chips coming off tells you that the metal chips heated up as they left. And if you're able to compare that with the workpiece, uh, you can say that the heat left with the chips and it didn't discolor the workpiece. If the workpiece stays in normal color, but the chips are colored, then that's a good sign that all of that has left and you've, you've lost it. You can also get um, some fire stain is another thing that can happen if you're working on metals and you heat them up. This is another one that Ada may know about with jewelry, but fire stain can be something that's there and you can, you can cover it up a couple different ways, but it looks like this was silver plated. Uh, a silver plated watch. And so silver plating was there to cover up fire stain. And then as the silver plating wears away, you might be able to see that once again as the watch gets older and older. So those are interesting things. But metals change colors for lots of reasons. This is just an interesting one for tempering and tempering colors within metals. This is another one that's sort of an advanced. If you're thinking about how do you machine metals and how do you make it work, this is one that's a little bit more advanced. Um, as a concept, but there's lots of other reasons why things might change colors. And so I think it's interesting. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, uh, Jamie had a question and I had a, a similar question about um, I, basically using the process to change the color, like for, to get an effect. Jamie, if you want to jump in, feel free. Yeah, well, um, just like while Jamie's unmuting. Uh, oh, are you good? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, um, my question is, um, I'd like to make a, a copper angle uh, for my threshold. Uh, the back door is in the sliding door. Um, and they don't sell that, so I'd have to, I think, make that from a piece of, like, sheet copper. Mm -hmm. And then I'm curious if I could make, um, using this process, a blue-green patina. Yeah, oh, absolutely. absolutely. Yes, yeah. Um, it, uh, depending on how much, like, where it's going to see, if it's a threshold, that might be quite a bit. Uh, you, you know, you might want to make choices about, like, you, you, you can do a heat patina on copper, which is what... Corey, Corey was, talking was talking about, about earlier. earlier. Um, uh, then there's and, also a chemical but, patina. For yeah, you could also do a chemical patina, patina and like, like co copper, copper in particular, in particular when, it, when it when it uh, oxidizes, oxidizes, it tends to be this, this kind, kind of like greenish, greenish bluish. Blue -ish. It's um, the Statue of Liberty color. Yeah, I mean, I think sometimes it's a little bluer. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, but uh, 
Um, um, not, not that, that it's, it's blue, blue, but just a little bluer than, than that, that color. color. Uh, uh, but, but and you and can you also, also do a little bit of a combination of those. Um, yeah, yeah uh, uh, if you have, you have like, like pictures, pictures of what, what you're thinking of, of um, send, send them to me and we can chat. chat. Uh, OK. Yeah, I will. Here's like, um, these are gutters that would have been made out of copper. Copper was a, you know, a very, uh, I don't know, a very, very nice house might have copper gutters. They're super expensive at this point. Very old house might have it. Um, but then they turn this bluish color that is, like Ada was saying, this is a chemical treatment where it's just oxidizing. So it's, it's essentially just a rust layer, but copper rusts a different color. Um, copper looks like it is golden and or it's orange in like a normal context but if you put it into a chemical solution you put it through chemical reactions it almost always turns a bluish blue green color there there are also uh chemical patina that are, uh are like very red oh yeah 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 like really bad um like yeah here. uh no, no much better than that um let me, I'll, I'll look at the picture one second. Like this kind of a red color? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah there's, and so this is, it says baking soda and table salt. I mean, it's, it's interesting to see how you can get these different patinas to show up. Uh, but essentially you've got chemical reactions that are happening across the surface. Of, of some metals, and that really can lead to interesting looks. Um, because the chem... Uh, uh, another, another way you can get a kind of, kind of similar red color with copper, copper is, um, um, uh, like, when, when, when you're heating, heating copper, copper and you're working with copper, copper the fire, fire scale, scale on it is usually either red, red or, like, blackish. blackish. And, and more, more often, often it's blackish, blackish. Um, but... but that, that and you probably, you probably know more about, about the chemistry, chemistry of this, this but, but my understanding, understanding is that, that uh, uh, um, when, when it has, it has fairly good access, access to oxygen, oxygen it, forms it forms that black, black kind, of kind of oxide because that needs two oxygen, oxygen atoms. atoms. Uh, whereas, whereas the the, the red the redder red oxides uh, have, have one oxygen, oxygen atom, and so like when it is being heated but, but parts, parts of the, of the copper, copper are in like a pretty anaerobic, anaerobic sort of environment. environment. Like maybe um, um, something's, something's really, really tightly folded. folded. Um, it, uh, uh, when, it's when it's heated, heated it, it will get, get that, that kind of, of the oxides, oxides will have that kind of color to them. Yeah, it's, it's a fascinating, um, all of this metallurgy is fascinating and you can go super, super deep with exactly how and why this is going to work. That's a lovely piece. <laughs> I don't know um, if you can actually make out the color on the, but like, it, yeah, it, yeah. Kind of see how, how the, the color of the change. Mm -hmm. That's, because That's because it was folded. Um, and and you know, the, the heat part of that thing, and the, the inside there, Essentially, no air at all. Um, the extremely little oxygen, so forms the red oxide, and then on the edges, the black oxides. Yeah, no, that's great. There's there's tons of good ways that you can get colors and patinas across metals, and you definitely it takes it totally takes some legwork to make sure that you've got it. Oh, more examples. Awesome. Um, you, make, you can, can like really, really see the red versus the blue, or I don't know, maybe you can, maybe you can. We're working on it. Oh yeah, you can totally see the red versus the black. The black is on the outer edges where it would be out on its own, and then the red is deeper in. Yeah. It, yeah. It's, yeah. That's awesome. All right, so what are other reasons you might get colors from metals? Let's start with over here on the left. This is completely a temporary one, uh, but it, it bears mentioning just because we all think about metals being red hot. Um, when you get something hot enough, you'll get this process called black body radiation, which is totally a physics concept. 
uh, where something gets hot enough and it starts to glow. And so th this is the same thing that lets infrared goggles work where you can see people giving off infrared light. And if you get something warmer, it starts to glow red and then glow orange and then glow white hot. Uh, but we pretty much never get things hotter than that. But you've probably seen a blue flame, just like out of a burner or whatever. Blue would be even hotter than yellow or orange, even though our intuitive sense for that based on plumbing fixtures in bathrooms doesn't necessarily make sense, where blue is for cold because that's ice color and red is for hot because that's fire color. Uh, for black body radiation, it's pretty much exactly flipped. And fun side note, this is also the same reason why stars glow in colors. And so star, our star, the sun, glows white hot. Uh, it may look a little yellow. That's because of really, uh, really scattering in the sky where the sky is blue. And so the sun looks a little bit yellow. But if you get something glowing hot, you'll get this light that comes off of it. It's very temporary, uh, but it's fascinating to see that that's what's going on. Also, fun side note, Pumbaa, who said that all of the stars are giant burning balls of gas, was mostly right. They're not actually burning because there's no oxygen in that process. They're just glowing hot from the nuclear fusion happening in their cores. But that's its own distinction. Uh, next up, you've got rusting or patinas, where metal bonds with oxygen. We call it a rust or a patina. And rusts, and I just went through with rusts on this. I should have probably included patinas. But rusts can often be brittle, and water is often a catalyst. Um, I remember really distinct, you know, growing up in the Midwest and here in Connecticut, it seems like it's no different. Uh, but allegedly in, in the Southwest, where there's very little humidity in your environment, things take much, much longer to rust. And so cars, undercarriages stay a lot better. Whereas in Cleveland, I had to change out the brake lines on a car that had just completely rusted out. So your amount of humidity can, can totally change how uh, rust forms and how that, how that grows. It can change how patinas form. And so you've got different amounts of those that can build up in different environments. Um, it's part of the reason why Egyptian jewelry holds up so nicely is because it's all in Egypt where there's far less humidity to, to put it through the processes that, that it has to undergo here, where there's lots of humidity in the environment. So there's lots of interesting things to take into account for that. But you can totally manage this process, just like Ada was showing, uh, and, and sort of like was done a little bit with the Statue of Liberty. It was made nice and shiny. They knew that it would patina while it was being transported from France to America and over the years. So it's got this consistent patina across its surface, which gives it its iconic uh, green, green blue color, mostly green. So those are all important things to take into account. You can totally manage this if you'd like so that you get a particular look if you're going for that, if you're going for a particular look. One thing that sticks out in my mind, I remember distinctly being in high school and being told uh, by someone's older brother who'd gone to art school that if you wanted to get your copper colored blue, you could pee on it. I don't know why that stuck with me, but it's just such a weird like zap of a uh, idea. It's an interesting chemical reaction to be considering, but you know, that I, maybe that's not a recommended one for this week, but if you're looking for blue copper, try it. Um, Mill scale is another thing. Oh yeah, does that work? <laughs> I mean, I personally haven't done it, but that, but that's absolutely true. Okay, uh, good to know. Okay, so that maybe maybe that's somebody's charge. Come up with a blue copper project, and we will ask you no questions about how it got there. <laughs> um, let's see. Another one that's really important. This is one that's going to come up if you're using the steel bar, the the one inch steel bars that you can get here or steel tubes, is mill scale. Mill scale is something you'll get. It's a flaky blue oxide layer that sits on the surface, and it can protect. It, it's just something that comes as a result of a heat treating process. So you'll get this. Essentially, it's a rust layer, but instead of being so tightly bonded and integrated into the material, it sits on the surface. Because of the heat treating, when things cool, it, it ends up being flaky. Um, it can be protective for the metal that's underneath until you have a crack in the seam and then it actually accelerates the rusting process. So it can be protective for a while, but then once it starts to flake off and break off, you have all sorts of problems. And if you've ever seen someone blacksmithing, which is we don't have the equipment yet to do that, although if you want to upvote Ada's request for an anvil, we can get closer. The, uh, the little chip parts that you see coming off of blacksmithing, that's removing, that's mill scale falling off of the steel. So when you, when you see a blacksmith hammering and there's little flaky pieces falling off. That's the mill scale that would be falling right off of it. 
Um, so those are three other ways that you can get colors to change beyond just the, the tempering. And so tempering is really good, especially for steel and copper. They take tempering really nicely. You can get colors that happen that way. And you can get other colors, whether they're temporary through black body radiation or rusting or mill scale, you can get other colors that way. And then you can get chemical, this is rusting and chemical treatments is really a good way to make a lasting color change if you want it. Um, and some metals do that really nicely, like copper is, is deliberately, for a long time, it has been something that's been used for gutters or for window flashings to put like over a window when you're building a house so that when the rainwater comes down and it hits the window, instead of coming in, the copper would redirect it outward. And even though copper will patina over time, it won't ever rust through like steel would in the same scenario. So it can be a good way to make a lasting, uh, a lasting part of a house if you want to redirect rainwater out of, a, out of an area like a window. So those are totally, uh, really, oh yeah. Really quickly, uh, if you want to see some really cool rust design, um, there's, I don't know if anybody's heard of like rat rotting, where you oh. take a car and you purposely cause parts of it to rust, um, and then you coat it with a special coating so it doesn't continue to rust. And they, you can get some really cool effects and really cool cars. They're, they're meant to look like junkyard cars you can race. <laughs> I mean, that looks pretty fun. Yeah, uh, they, they did a lot of rat rotting for Mad Max Fury, sorry, Mad Max Fury Road. Yeah, that totally makes sense, where you can manage it and then you can stop the process. It makes total sense. Yeah, uh, which is, and like I think of all of the, all of the different things that, are in like a Hobby Lobby that are meant to be decorations that are meant to look old timey, like you're from a farm and they're rusted, but somebody completely just made them so they could sell them for a quick buck. Uh, they, I'm sure that they had this managed rust process happen to them so they can look old in a, in a managed and thoughtful way. Yeah, that's fascinating. A rat rod car. Yeah, look at, look at that. It's lots of, lots of fun to be had there actually. That looks like I should really figure out how that works. It's pretty cool. Okay. Um, so yeah, those are all different pieces that would be good to take into account. But let's talk about the lathe and milling. So those are all interesting sort of like chemical level processes that we've been talking about. So that's been my inner chemistry teacher really coming out to shine over the past you know little while. Uh, but let's talk about the lathe, which is something, there's definitely two videos here. We're not going to have time to watch them now, but I'm leaving them in this slideshow because absolutely they're fascinating. Um, and the title of this one is the 1751 machine that made everything. You can pretty, pretty neatly make an argument that says that the metal lathe, when it was invented, started the industrial revolution. And that's what that video really makes as a point, is that the, the lathe, which has to do with spinning a workpiece, is something that's been around for a long, long time. Anytime that you can spin something that you want to shape, you've essentially got a lathe, and there's some really good videos. Maybe I'll tweet out a Grandpa Amu video of this, this lovely older gentleman in China who does traditional style woodworking. He spins wood pieces just like by he having a- so, Just putting, just putting in, in a word, word for that. that. Oh yeah, he's so good. It's so, it's so entertaining. And he's got a little grandson with him some of the time that's adorable. Uh, he's so good but he makes traditional lathes in the oldest style. But as we move forward and we think about the metal lathe, it really became the thing that ushered in the industrial revolution. And so metal lathes, even at this 1751 level, they're finely tuned machines that added much more precision to the way that we make things. It's called the king of the machines. If you were to talk to most machinists, they definitely have lots of moving parts. I was excited to do the lathe class here. Would totally recommend it. Um, the, the first modern ones came about in France because they realized that they had uh, weaving machines that needed upgraded parts. And in order to build those upgraded parts, they didn't have the tooling to be able to do it, so they had to invent the tooling first. So they have these machines, which I totally would recommend you go watch this video. It's about 15 minutes long and it's really well done. I think it's somewhere in the ballpark of uh, half a million views. So it's, it's totally a, a nice production value, just in case you're curious. 
But the, the neat thing about a metal lathe is that it's basically got all that it needs to be completely self-replicating, where you can build just about everything, whether it's turning something that's round, whether it's putting a thread into something, or whether it's just making a flat piece. You can actually make flat surfaces with a lathe as well if instead of spinning the workpiece, you spin the tool and move the workpiece into it. So you can totally make flat things or round things with a lathe, but by and large, they're, they're for making round pieces. And so they're really what enabled the Industrial Revolution. And I got to click past these so that they don't talk at us. But the metal lathe, we have two of them in the, in the shop. Here are our two lathes, the green one and then the big gray one. And then I think this is a great image right here of what it looks like, that you've got your workpiece that's spinning, and then you bring an almost stationary tool up to it so that you can put cuts in it. And so as you're doing that, you're going to be able to cut away the material. And this is one of the things where the chips coming off, those are where you're going to look at them. And if they're colored blue, then you know that the heat is being removed with the chips. If your workpiece is colored blue, then your workpiece is really hot. And then you've got a speed feed issue where you want to think about some logistics there. It can take a lot of fine tuning to really get an intuitive sense for how you want the spin rate and the cut rate and all those things to work. Um, but it is an interesting process. And it's a little bit more forgiving than you'd think. It's just if you want to really push the edge of what your lathe can do. Um, so there's, there's lots of, whoops, there's lots that can be done with this. One of the big things with a metal lathe is that you can put not only can you shape things into round or cylindrical shapes, but you can also put threads in it. They usually have two pieces. They have a drive hex bar that will spin and be able to move your lathe in an automated, fa automated fashion where you're in control of it to some extent. And then there's also a lead screw where you can use a screw that's really well defined on the lathe to put threads onto the pieces that you're working with. And so last week I was working with Anna and Aaron, and we were working on a piece, and the whole time I was wondering how would, how would I have made it? And you need a metal lathe in order to make such a thing where you've got like a, a hex rod that you'd have turned down into a cylinder and another cylinder, and then you cut threads into it. So you can make all sorts of interesting joiner pieces where you've got adapters that fit from one to the other. Uh, and so you can build a lot of interesting pieces with a lathe where you're cutting threads out of raw cylindrical metals and really able to make interesting adapters. There's tons and tons of words that go along with this. If I were to harken back to our discussion about naming, if this is a 1751 machine, 1751 is in the peak of when people like to draw up distinctions and names and categories, which is, again, not a great thing for humans to be doing. We're more similar than different. Uh, but Naming all of the different parts is really a common thing to learn early on in learning how to use a lathe. So there's lots of vocabulary that will come up. And I, I, this diagram is nice because it points out all those things, it shows those things. But you learn about the saddle, the, the, saddle, the, ap, the apron, the tailstock, the headstock, the, the face. There's lots of different terminology that goes along with a lathe, all of which can seem intimidating, but most of which you can learn sort of once you figured out how it works. So it's completely an interesting thing um, to, to do, and it will level up your ability to make stuff. But you want to take into account that this is a big machine with lots of power, and so you've got to treat it with respect as well. It totally makes sense that there's a complete class that you have to take that's pretty long and has a, has a cost. We need, you need an expert to show you how this works. Uh, I might be able to run it nearby you, but I would not want to be the one to show you how this works and say that, yes, you get it. Because they're, they're, even though they're fundamentally a simple thing, just because you've got such powerful motors and such high torque, it's definitely something that you want to take a second look at to make sense of. And then sort of the, the intellectual sibling to the lathe is the mill. Right? In the case of the lathe, you're spinning the thing that, that you're working on, and the cutting tool stays still. The mill or the bridge port, the exact opposite is true. So your tool is what spins, and then you move the workpiece around to hit that tool, or sort of a combination of those two. It's, it's a lot like a large drill press, but you can move the drill press table all at once as well. And so this has got its own piece. The, the Bridgeport mill has got a lot of turns and hand cranks so that you can manually move around your workpiece and be able to cut into it. It's another one that has a large class. Uh, in order to, you can make very high and very high quality and precision parts on a Bridgeport. But they're definitely another one that really requires a, a set of skills to be able to run them. 
They've got the exposed cutting tool head. There's going to be chips flying. There's things that you need to manage, things that you have to take into account. Uh, and then the end mills themselves have their own character that needs to be considered. Like here's a flattening end mill and here's a, a spiral cut end mill where you get chips flying off in predefined ways. These machines are really powerful. They're really able to do a lot, um, but they can also cut right through themselves because they're able to cut metal. So you've got to be a little bit, you need to be conscious of what you're doing. Uh, they also would not hesitate to, to cut through you if you needed to, if they were going to. So you've got to be extra careful with this. Again, there's a training class if you want to go after this one, but it's totally an interesting one to take into account. And, and, and when you're doing this, you can really feel it happening. As you're cranking things through, you're in charge of what's going on. So you'll be able to move the pieces around as you want to, which can be interesting but also complicated if you're trying to get real precision pieces to work. Um, and then to go along with this, there's the Derex end mill sharpener, just because the tools themselves get dull over time. So sharpening your tools is really important on the bridge port, just like on the lathe. You want the, as much as you're learning the machine, you're also learning about the tooling and how to keep that sharp and nicely cutting. So those are all important pieces. This is a good video. Uh, and this one, let's see where we're at for time. We may have time to watch just a little bit of this. I don't know if I'm sharing in the right way for you all to hear it, but this video is from NYC CNC and this guy, John, walks you through the bridge port and then he walks you through the CNC mill. The bridge port has been around for a long, long time. It's a traditional machining tool. It's all run with levers and gears and pulleys and those things that, that make it feel a little bit intimidating and a little bit exciting. Uh, it does all of that in a very manual sort of way. And then the CNC is the spiritual successor where the manual is all given away to automation so that instead of you turning cranks to move things, it's all computer controlled. So you can have, if you wanted to make a circular bend or, or a round, it would be really hard on a bridge port because you have to move the one axis and then the next axis and then one and back and one and back uh, in, a, in a very controlled and particular way. But on a CNC, you can just tell a computer, I would like a circle, please and it will make all of the axes move around in just the right way so that it gets that cut for you. So there's lots of interesting things to take into account. Um, and then here I've got this, this played out. The, let's see if I can do this without audio. Yeah, that's good, just to sort of see how this works. Turn off the audio, we'll hop over here to 130, the guy's talking. But you can see it's totally a drill press. At its, at its most fundamental, it's a drill press with a much heavier, uh, the much heavier spindle. So the spindle is much sturdier, it's much stronger, and you can move that end mill up and down into your workpiece. And as you can see, as he's going through the cranks, you're turning cranks and spinning so that you can get motion in the different axes. And if you manage that motion just right, you can get things to move the way that you want. So you imagine your drill press table sort of moving underneath the drill. Uh, drills are, are just good for going into a piece, whereas end mills can cut on the sides just about as well or better then they can cut down along their axial piece. So as he's sort of walking through, he's talking about the, the glamour of this, you can see that he's able to manually move the end mill along the piece and use that to flatten off a top surface or cut off an edge, and he's manually cranking this around. So this is definitely something where you feel, feel the action happening as it goes, and he's actively controlling what, what happens with the mill. So all of that is an, an interesting piece that you're managing manually. But then if we hop over to the CNC portion, it's a similar tool in a lot of ways, uh, but this is all controlled by keyboard. And so you've probably seen me playing around with the woodshop CNC, and he's just controlling it with keyboard controls. That's completely normal for most CNCs. They often have shift and arrow keys for controls, but you got to be careful so that you know where and how fast they're going to go. Uh, but this can accept manual commands like that. But the, the real power comes when you can have a design process where you have a thought that you want to make, then you generate a 3D design, then you turn that into tool paths, then you get G-code from there, then you get the machine to run the G-code, and you can get it to make the cuts that you want it to cut. So there's lots of interesting things. We're going to really explore and deep dive on CNCs, but as we're doing metalworking, it's completely important that you see that this is something that you can do with metal. And so right now, he's just using the end mill to make those cuts, and you can see how nicely it's managing it, that the computer's in, in charge. 
those corners are nice and crisp, but the chips are coming off really consistently. Uh, there's no worry about coloration and it's using hot air to, to move all those things out of the way. It's even doing, let's see, when it's doing the edges, you can see it ramps off so that it has a nice smooth finish. And then this is a helical lead in. So a computer can design all of your tooling and all of your paths so that you get the nicest possible cuts and that you don't put extra strain, that you get as extended of a tool life as possible. CNC milling is something that I think would be a real stretch for somebody to hop into right now. If you wanted to jump in and do that this week, you, you could, um, but it would be a, a tough go. We're gonna have a CNC unit where we go over sort of the basics of how do you design for this? How do you get all the pieces to come out of it? And sort of where does this go? Because getting an automated cutting process is really one of the most powerful things that you can do with all of our automated tools. So it's an interesting process that we're gonna take a look at as we move forward. But next slide, here we go. Nope, no, nope. click on. So the conceptual overview. In general, this is our PCNC, so it's the same exact machine that was just in that video. It's an automated bridge port is really what you're looking at. But you have many steps that you need to go through before you have the ability to just magically turn on the button and hit go. You have to have an idea and then a 3D model usually is the next step, which is something that's managed through a CAD software. Then you take your model and turn it into a machine tool or into tool paths, which is a CAM process where you take a 3D model and you turn it into something else. Then you'll export it into G code through some post processing. Then you'll need to set up your CNC so that it's homed, hope that there isn't any backlash, which is a problem that we've run into with the, the big wooden one that's now solved. Then you'll need to actually run the machine and then clean up the CNC work area. And then if there's any like follow-up touch-up work because your tooling wasn't maybe sharp enough or your, or your speeds and feeds were a little bit off, you may need to do some post-processing uh, on parts also. But running a CNC can really let you get some amazingly complicated parts. There's some examples down here and they're a little small, uh, but here a five axis CNC is able to not only move in three dimensions, but to rotate in two so that you can get really complicated geometries. When you're talking about jet engine parts, they're often cut on a CNC like this so that they can get very complicated geometries to come out of these machines. And they can be built to very, very tight tolerances to one tenth of a thousandth, one ten thousandth of an inch of tolerance can, can easily be achieved by many CNC machines. And higher end ones can accomplish even more. So you've got very high precision machining. And a good MacBook body, the aluminum chassis of a MacBook, those were all CNC'd on the inside, so they perfectly fit the motherboard. Um, there's lots of examples where machined aluminum or machined steel are around in your everyday life. So those are interesting things to take into account as you're thinking about how you'd wanna build something if it's often beyond your ability to, to make it, it may have been built by a, a master craftsman, but increasingly it's gonna be built by a robot. And a CNC robot is probably what it is. Which brings us to one more type of cutting. We've got water jet cutting, which is another CNC process. It's not a spinning end mill. In this case, it's high pressure water and often a sand abrasive that's going to be pushed downward through some material and each chip of sand will slowly cut away, well, sort of slowly cut away, the material that's underneath it. So this high pressure stream of water can cut through apples or plates of metal or a really thick piece of a metal if you're given enough time so that you've got a totally uh, nice cut. And this can include cutting through lots of different things. There are some design constraints with a water jet cutter, but if you ask Lior about it, he'll be like, I don't know how we did anything before we had the water jet cutter which is obviously not true, but um, he's just enamored with it. It's a fantastic tool that can make all kinds of cuts. You can design, it's fundamentally usually a two-dimensional design process. So we're gonna get to it when we talk about the laser cutter and the vinyl cutter. You'll be equally able to design for the vinyl, for the water jet cutter. There's, the tricky parts are that there's definitely a speed up and speed down process for the water jet stream itself. So unlike the laser that can instantly be turned on and off, the water jet has a certain amount of time that it takes to turn on and a certain amount of time to turn off. So you won't be able to get completely crisp things unless you're planning for where the lead in and where the lead out is gonna go. Luckily, that's all managed pretty well by the Global Max software that comes along with this. And if you wanna get the software to play around with the water jet cutter, you can get it and download it from the Makehaven website for the water jet. 
but then you need to message Lior through the metal, through Slack, and he'll get you a code. There's instructions on how to do it. I have done it. I have it at home. Uh, and I think that as long as you're tied to Makehaven, there's plenty of licenses to go around. It is, the one interesting thing about water jet cutting and some ideas for it is that it can cut through pretty much anything. So it's really good for repeated metal parts like this. So if you wanna have something that's really repetitious, or if you wanna have something that's really gonna be hard to do if you were cutting it any other way, like this metal handrail for, uh, for a lofted area. It can also cut through non-metal materials. So here it's cutting through a giant piece of stone. It's a good way to put detail on a gravestone, morbidly, uh, but it totally is, to cut through or to put in detail, or to cut like a stone inlay for a floor. So this would be like for the Department of the Navy, this is a nice stone inlay on a, a marble tile floor, or granite tile floor. So you can get different colors and different shapes to draw out those things if you really wanted to design that. All of that can be cut with a water jet cutter. And then because it's CNC cut, they can be a very nice fit so that everything comes together and it's well within the tolerances you need to fill in those seams with grout. Uh, so if you're trying you know, to design a really nice stone floor for your entryway uh, in, in your mansion, I guess, this could be a great process to build, to, to design and make that for yourself because that's a problem we all have, right? Uh, you can also cut through stone. I like that this, you can use the cuts not all the way through to just add a texture. So you can definitely texture the surface of things. But when you cut through, it's a little trickier. This is actually glass in the bottom left here by where it says examples. That's cut through glass. You need to be careful though that it's not tempered glass, that it's not got any strain built up in it. You want just like a regular float glass um, that's generally untempered, something that's, I would say, usually a softer glass, one that's a little less brittle although most glass is just considered brittle. But with certain glasses, you can absolutely cut through it, or with mirrors, you can often cut through on the water jet cutter. Uh, there's even a wine bottle over by the water jet that Kate has tried to cut through. But what's tricky is that as soon as you get through the first layer, all of that water just sort of splays outwards, and then you get some destruction from the, the diffracted sand and water. Right, Kate? <laughs> yep, it's a, little, it's a little tricky. Hopefully, we can get something. There are laser inserts that will let you cut open a bottle, but for the water jet, it's a little harder. Um, but it could, maybe it's possible. I, I don't know. I'm not, I have not mastered the machine, but it is an interesting one to consider. The design that I have done for the water jet has been pretty limited, but it's been, uh, I, I made a plan for making metal origami on the water jet, where it would perforate all of the, bold li the fold lines for origami so that I can make a, a folded metal shape. I need to dig up those designs and try and actually cut it out. But um, those, are, those are all things that can happen pretty nicely on the water jet, where you can get these sorts of cut shapes that are very unique. And then the last process that we're gonna go over today that's, that's new for metals, because we're going through these like higher level processes that lots of them have chemistry going on, is electroplating. So electroplating is something where you're going to build a thin layer of metal through some electrochemistry often. You can do this as a chemical way with a resin and some, and some copper, some metal powders. Uh, but the electro, electrical le electroplating is an interesting one where you can take copper and a copper sulfate solution with maybe some acid in there and use it to dissolve copper and get it to be deposited onto another material. This is good for copper coating things. And this is like little bronze baby booties. There's a, I was always terrified by this really old set of baby booties that my grandparents had at their house. This has been a process that's around for a long time. You coat the shoes in something conductive and then you can make this happen where the shoes are turned to copper. I think also now it's often done in a chemical process that gets the same look. It's just not as like exotic of a process. This is often done for electronics connectors though where you can do gold electroplating so you'd have a, a gold solution and a gold anode where you're getting gold to deposit on connectors. And so if you buy high-end cables to get your electronics to join, they'll often have golden plugs. So that's something that can be done pretty, pretty nicely. Although I'd say that's a, probably a very expensive process. Galvanized nails and galvanized buckets. You can see the galvanizing structures, the crystalline structures across the surface. That works really well, but you get a really thin layer of zinc deposited on top of steel that adds rust resistance. 
Galvanized things also don't try and uh, weld them. The, the, galvan is, the galvanized layer is gonna be nasty, nasty business if you ever turn that into a vapor. It's super toxic, you don't wanna breathe it. So don't ever weld galvanized steel. But it is super helpful if you have some steel that you wanna keep nice when you know it's gonna be in a wet environment, like galvanized steel nails for a deck or a galvanized bucket for carrying around water. Another place where you can electroplate is chrome plating so that you can get a nice super shiny finish onto rims of, of cars or on interior parts to cars. Those totally work. There's some really good examples of electroplating like this where you can get a nice look with a thin layer over the surface. This is now like how we make pennies since we make mostly our pennies out of zinc and then we just put a copper, thin, thin copper layer across the top so that you get a copper look that's just thick enough that it's not gonna wear through, but it's still almost entirely zinc because zinc is just barely less than a penny for a penny's worth of metal. Uh, Kate, did you ever do that copper thing, the, the penny deal? Got the Got stuff. stuff, we haven't done it yet though. We were gonna, the, the <laughs> family is, is, we're gonna do it over Thanksgiving when we're all kind of boom. Kind of that sounds together. nice. <laughs> That'll be good. It should, it should happen over just a couple of days where you get the zinc to really dissolve away. And you can see that copper layer that's on the outside of the zinc because zinc will dissolve much more readily in an acid solution. Um, also, when you're done, I was thinking about it. When you're done with that, you want to make it a baking soda volcano so that you can get it to neutralize before you put it down your sink. So mix some baking soda in before you drop it down the sink. Um, but yeah, this is electroplating is an interesting process that you can also try. And so it's a neat way to build something I was thinking about this for, um, Ben was talking about building a copper stand for his Chemex. And so when doing that, it might be hard to build it all out of copper and have a really nice consistent look, unless you're buying a copper brazing material like Ada was talking about. Another way to get that would be to, to build it with basically whatever material you want, and then you could coat it with some electrochemistry to be the color of the thing that you'd like it to be. So if you wanted it to be gold plated or silver plated, you could, or copper plated, you could absolutely make that happen. You can buy kits, especially for copper plating. You can buy kits to make this happen in an interesting way. I'll also post a video of the Peter Brown on Shop Time, who did this for Chinese lantern uh, uh, plants. He coated them in a conductive paint, and then that conductive paint was enough that he could use it as a cathode for an electroplating plating process. So he was able to coat plants and leaves and, and other things in copper when they really shouldn't have been something that you could coat in copper. So it's interesting to see how this process can be used and expanded. But that I think is the end of our like predefined setup of all these weird processes that go along with metals beyond just cutting and using machine tools. So these are some of the things that are unique to metals that I think are, are a bit more interesting uh, and set them apart from wood as processes that you can use. They're absolutely, uh, some of them are, are a little bit more beginner friendly, like soldering and welding and brazing. Those can be interesting uh, to try as you're just getting started. Some of them can be a little bit harder. Like if you're trying to do some tempering or if you're trying to hop on to the, the lathe or the bridge port, those are definitely gonna be a bit more of a time commitment. But they're, they're totally interesting things. I think there is a bridge port class coming up on Sunday, perhaps, if I'm not mistaken. And that's a small group of people. It's a max at four. So if you're wondering, it should still all be running just fine, given our current coronavirus moment. But um, that's a small enough class that it should be totally fine. So those are, those are all options for how you could move forward through the week. Um, and so now the last, the last bit is I want to ask people, how, how are you doing? What's going on with projects? Where are we at? Can you share your screen and give us an update? It'd be lots of fun to hear what people are up to. Anybody? I can go first because I probably have anything to say. Um, um, I have I mainly been, 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 been ill, Ill and, and watching gadget videos, videos and, and um, that's been, been about, about it, it this mm -hmm. week. Gotcha. Yeah, badging videos I think are actually a great way to spend some time if you're you know not able to make it in. There's I yeah, yeah. Um, um, 
and then and also there, there are just like a few things that you've mentioned. I've gotten a couple of sort of YouTube rabbit holes based on things that have come up in the glasses. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds fun. What's what's your most recent YouTube rabbit hole? Well, I'll be honest with you. I'm a woodworker, so it, was, it has really been Japanese joinery a lot. <laughs> Like yeah. I've, I've, and then, then I've followed, followed that, that in a few different directions. directions. So, um, Japanese, Japanese house building without, without nails, nails entirely, entirely through joinery. This, this has been, been just, just really, really fun. fun. Good. That's exciting. All right. Anybody else want to share? I'll go. Though. Yeah. Let's hear it, Jamie. Um, I'm, I'm working, working on, on my solar rack. rack. Um, I, I, I'm taking videos, but um, it's going to take a few more, and probably take another day until it's done, so I want to wait to share the video, the whole thing. But I can say that I, um, I got a $10 dock saw like about four months ago uh, at a yard sale, and that thing kicked ass. So I was able to, I, I bought the 16 foot. Uh, aluminum, aluminum C channel, channel and, and cut those, those down, down to size. size. So, so I have two 10, ten foot pieces. And then, and then today, today I got on top of the van, just started, started measuring. measuring. Um, I got I these got rack, rack, rack adapters. adapters. Um, and, and so, so I'm, 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 I just spent like about an hour taking measurements and then, then um, tomorrow, tomorrow then, I'm, I'm, I also made a, a cardboard template, template of, of the, 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 the C channel, channel that goes with, with that, that I'm fitting to the, the uh, mount, mount so, that so that the cut is perfect. perfect. Um, so, that, so that, you know, I can you know, check it, line it, line it up. up. I took I all took the measurements and put the measurements on the cardboard template, and then I'm going to mount that on top to make sure. It's perfect, perfect tomorrow, tomorrow, and then from and there, then I'm, gonna I'm gonna drill. drill. And then, and then um, I'm gonna I'm somehow, somehow schlep these huge, huge solar, solar panels, panels onto my onto roof. roof. Not, Not quite, quite sure how sure I'm gonna, gonna do that, that but, but it's gonna, it's get, gonna done. get done. Have to get, get done. done. So, so um, I, bought I bought this like eleven dollar panel holder because I saw you using it for the plywood the other day. So I think that's gonna work for the solar panels. Yeah, panel holders are great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah, I, 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 used I used to move, to move a lot with my dad, dad when I you know, was in the summer. summer. So, so um, I'll, I'll probably, probably use belt, 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 blank, blank, and all kinds of things, things and just make sure the panel panels are wobble. wobble. Um, and, then and then what else? else? Uh, I'm, I'm also, also cutting it into my thing, I think, tins and gold later. So I'm going to be using a four inch hole. Um, hole saw? Yeah, yeah hole saw on my impact driver. And then, and then I also so this, this um, <laughs> uh, well, well, actually, I didn't make this another, I made it in my mind. I took it and I also, also made a piece sign that I want to solder onto it because it would, it would be, be like the like most hypocritical weapon ever. <laughs> it um, looks, that, the, I would like want to fold it. It looks like it's ready to become a, a a super metallic ice cream cone. <laughs> like this, this thing? thing? <laughs> yeah, like it's, yeah. Oh, oh, oh wow, well, well, I never, I never thought, thought of that. that. Maybe, Maybe I'll bring will try, because I'm, I'm... Yeah, that'd be fun. Yeah, yeah. I, I have it, and I just don't want to lose it. So, so let's, let's yep. try to end it. it. Yeah. Something. So that's so what I did. Oh, and I'm going to do that. Um, those were just... just Designs that came in the water jet, jet I, uh, program. program. So, so no, no creativity on my, on my part. part. They were just just how to use it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's all right. Cool. Uh, sounds like a productive week. It looks like Ben is unmuted. Ben, you want to go next? <laughs> um, um, well, well, I did, I did some welding, welding things, things to Leor the generosity. We are building a big. Uh, uh, Rack, rack uh, for, uh, for wood, wood, wood in the back, in the back of the space, space and he's welding up the other side. 
yeah, 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 bad phonetic welder, and then helped them put that together. And then I also procured the materials for the copy thing that Corey was referencing earlier. So I have to get a bad sound. The other stuff to do that. Cool. Yeah, that sounds that sounds like fun. That's a giant wood rack that that you guys made. So I'm gonna just imagine that you did half of the welds. Great job. <laughs> Yeah, you yeah, can look at the welds and you can definitely, you can definitely tell which ones I made. <laughs> no, only the good ones. That's that's what I think. Definitely, definitely not. not. <laughs> All right, let's see who's next. Hi. Hey, Ruby. Oh. You go you first. Go first. Okay, okay, I'll go first. Hey, hey. Um, so this, this week, Ada, Ada has uh, very, very, very generously offered to uh, show, show me a lot um, in terms of like jewelry uh, metal working. And, and so, so I bought, bought some 14 gauge copper and they, uh, well, I don't know, just show you. So, so I, learned I learned how to, how to cut, cut it by, by hand, hand. Um, and, and I don't have a picture, picture of the earrings the themselves, themselves, but um, it's, it's really exciting, exciting and, and I want to learn more and I'll, I'll, I'll get, get there, there but um, I'm going to have, gonna some, have some, some copper earrings, earrings by, by I guess, I guess the, the end, end of this week, week. and yeah, it's, 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 I don't know, I don't it's, know. it's, 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 it kind of blows my mind, you know, because metal is like really hard and I can't snap it in half. So, so yeah 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 that's it's that that's awesome and i think i think that you know i made i very uh erroneously made a recommendation that you use a power tool which i think that is at this point it was well pointed out to me that was a mistake and i'm happy to acknowledge when i get things wrong and to learn doing doing the cuts by hand gives you way more control so it's it's not only neat to like feel that happen but then to have the fine-tuned control to make the cuts exactly what you want them to be is, is super cool. And it's just, it's kind, of, it's kind of amazing to have metal be able to be shaped in that sort of a way. I, I'm, I'm all with you for the, like, it's exciting to have metal. That gets yeah, cool. yeah. And again, and again I want to just, just like, like really, really publicly, publicly say, say thank you, Ada, for, for helping me. Uh, uh, with, and showing me everything. everything. You know, I really, I really enjoy, enjoy that. that. We, we, as a as class, have been able to teach like, like so, much so much about, about what, we, what know, we know uh, and, and contribute, contribute in that, in that way. way. And, and if I can do that for someone else, else, you know, I, I, I'm here. I'm here. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. Very well. no, no, fun. Fun. yeah. The, the like, sharing is my favorite part of this class so far. So, so, uh, uh, I guess I, I guess don't. I don't. Um, wait, wait, do I mind sharing, sharing that? Net? Sure, if you want to, yeah. Uh, okay. So, so uh, uh, I, had I had a project, a project that, that I wanted, wanted to, to use the water jet for, for um, um, but, but it, it also requires an anvil. Um, <laughs> so so I, I, I've been putting it off, sure. uh, and, and I did that. Um, and so uh, I ended up just doing some like uh, metal forming um, mostly this process called, um, well, yeah, I mean, basically everything that I was doing was some form of uh, forming, which is um, this is process of making kind of elaborate shapes out of uh, it's some, some sort, sort of sheet metal, metal. Um, um, like the process, process of like folding, folding it and, and forging, forging it and, and then, then like annealing it and unfolding, unfolding it and doing things, things like that, that over and over, over to build up these, these sort of compound, compound shapes. shapes. Uh, uh, so, so you can, can build, build up sort of complicated, complicated shapes without, without ever soldering um, or doing anything, anything like that. that. Uh, and it's all one piece. Um, so, so this was, this was, this was a, a, I think, I think fairly, fairly unsuccessful test that, that I did. Um, I, uh, was corrugating, corrugating it, it 
uh, uh, wall, wall folded. folded. And, 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 and I mean, I mean like, like, it's not, it's not totally, totally unsuccessful, unsuccessful in that, that I, I uh, figured, figured out, out that, that I can't, I can't push, push my, my hand, hand met sheet, sheet metal, metal corrugator this hard. This hard. Um, um, the, the, the stock, stock is, is just too thick. thick. Um, um, but then, then uh, uh, one shade that, that I think was, was more successful, successful. Um, and, and this, this one, one is, uh, is uh, I did, I did a very, very quick heat on. on. Um, um, is this? Is this? Oh. Um, and, and I don't, I don't really, really know, know what, what it's, it's for. <laughs> Uh, I, mean, uh, I mean, it's, it's not, not necessarily, necessarily anything, anything. Um, um, but, but uh, uh, I, had, I had done, done some, some fold forming, forming in, in uh, a couple, couple of months, months. Um, um, and I felt good to do some more. more. And, and so, so this, this was, was um, um, uh, uh, I'll, have I'll have to do, to do a, a post about, about this, this, I guess, because there's, there's a lot of steps, steps to it, but this was what's called a a forged, forged well, well so, so it, it, so it, it was, was from, from a forged, forged t-fold um and then uh when they opened, opened it up i you can see on the back it's like the um so on the back i used like a dab and punches to get some body in there so that um let's see uh yeah, it looks, it you know, looks it like has some three-dimensionality to it. At, At first, first, it was just, I was going, going to uh, replicate, replicate slightly, slightly larger um, this, this tiny piece they had done, done uh, a few months, months ago, ago. Um, which, which also has, has a forged, forged T-fold in it. it. Um, it's like, like a, a, like a, a kind, kind of torso, torso sort of thing. thing. I don't know how much. How much how well you can see, see it. it. Yeah. Um, but, but I made a made sloppy, sloppy T-fold, fold and, and so uh, I had to had do, to a, do lot a lot of work, work uh, to, to kind of, kind of pull, it pull it out. And, and uh, at a certain point, it, just, it became, became more of an experiment. An experiment in the sure. Yeah. The um, uh, I think I got that's muted. About it. Can you, oh, and oh, and there's a slight patina, but I don't, I don't know, know if you if can you really see, see that. that. It's, it's like in the, in the orange. It's, it's mostly, mostly in the orange, orange reddish, reddish purple, purple um, uh, area, but uh, there's a little bit of like the kind of yellowish and blues. Um, I don't know. It's, I don't know how much you can really see. see we can, I, I feel like I can see a lot. It's really, it's neat to see what all you're able to pull off. I love each one of those looked like a spine running right down the middle was what I, yeah, was yeah, what that, like. that, that was, that was like, like, uh, like, like what I was initially going for. for. Um, um, I, I just, just didn't, didn't end up having the, the room, room on this piece to really do much, much more of a, you know, much more in our Um, because, because I was, was a little, little out of practice, practice and, uh, and messed, messed up, up the first fold. <laughs> um, it happens, totally. But uh, yeah, yeah. I, so a project that I had been working on for a while um, uh, when Creative Arts Workshop was open um, before the plague, uh, and I, I was gradually building pieces to do like a life-size uh, skeleton, a me-sized skeleton. Um, so like this was the like a breastbone, like a sternum, uh, which is like steel with uh, brazing basically coated onto it. Um, but uh, I, I've been thinking about like combining some fold formed copper shapes uh, to, to do some of the more complicated bones. 
That's fascinating. There's so you're you're definitely got a heaping pile of skill that you're building your projects from, Ada, and it's just fun to watch. I feel like I feel like I'm learning from you, and I definitely others feel the same way. So it's great to just sort of watch what your your creative metalworking processes turn out to be. I mean, this, this is, is like, like this. Is I spent a couple hours on this because I was, I mean, really because I was just fixing the fuck up. Um, but like, and this was a few hours because it's more complicated and involves a couple other kinds of folds. It involved these curved folds that like you need to make the, make a, like cut halfway through the met, through the sheet metal and then uh, do this slow folding. Um, so, but, uh, a lot of the, these fold forming things, you can like build up complicated shapes, uh, quite, quite quickly. Um, and like I said, without having to solder, um, and, you know, attach pieces of metal, you can make entire pieces that are just, you know, a fold form. Uh, so. When uh, when Makehaven gets in the anvil, uh, they, that would be a fun thing to do, like a workshop on or something. Uh, absolutely, we'll keep you posted for if there's any progress. I'm looking at Jr. If there's any progress on the anvil, <laughs> and he's look, looking up very surprised. Just, Just a little. A little you know, no, plug <laughs> that may be good to have an AMVA. Yep. All right, let's have a, somebody else to share. Anybody else want to tell us what they did? There were a few more people. I can go. Yeah. Um, I didn't really do much in the metal shop this week. I had gotten badged on a bunch of stuff from Brandon the earlier week, and I had planned to learn how to weld just that was my goal just to learn how to weld and he came down with whatever or may not have come down with whatever so i'm going to let myself put that off until the next available appointment and i'm the queen of starting projects and not finishing them so i would i'm stuck now like even on the woodworking project i just need to kind of finish sanding and oiling and closing that off. And for the last project, I kind of got the, I got the tuft, tuft and gun going, but what I made is not pretty. So I still would like to do it again. And the project with the bow tie and the lights, the one I made was kind of just, let me see if I can do this. And I do want to make another one that's nicer. And also I've been, I'm in the middle of that and I want to submit it to like Kate's project book that she mentioned. So I'm kind of being more tedious about taking pictures and doing the steps along the way. So I've been kind of, that's where I am with the projects. Oh, and the metalworking project. I usually have had ideas for the other ones. And I finally decided for the metal one, I think I'm going to do a plant stand. So there's something. That's, that's where, where I, am. I am. That's that's cool. There's lots of there's lots of options for like what exactly to do. There's and it's and it's sometimes hard to choose from those. I, I would say that you've actually created a ton of really great things. So to think that they're not done, they're they're really substantial starts. If they're not finished, I would say that there's lots of them that you're you've made it a long way with. Uh, like I would have never known that the doggy bow tie wasn't finished. It's, it's wonderful. My sister has a pug. She absolutely loves the bow tie. <laughs> the, um, yeah, there's, it's really, yeah, there, it's awesome. I look forward to seeing what your plant stand will look like. Yeah. Yeah. And it's sometimes you don't know what they're going to be and then they just turn into something for you. I actually was a little inspired by Ruby's um, turning. So I was thinking maybe I could learn how to turn something and then put that along with the plant stand. But am I biting off more than I can chew here? Can I interrupt? 
Um, yes. What you were working on, was it last week? Was like really, really, really great, great, actually. actually it, it's it's probably, probably like, no, like, 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 like it's, it's probably, probably, it is better than whatever, 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 what, whatever, whatever it is that I was doing. Um, so, so I think I you're think really on your way there. Oh, thank yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, the testing looked, looked really good. good. Um, Thanks. I was just also kind of learning how to learn um, what shapes I can and can't make. And it's kind of easier to make a circle than a square because the yarn puffs out. Um, and what happens when you mix the two different colors and at towards the end, I was just kind of filling the palette with whatever I had left of whatever color yarn just to get it out of my life. So. And I think I didn't know what to do with it from here. And I was watching one of the um, videos on how to finish the rugs. And one of them seems pretty easy. I might just do it just to practice how to do it for if I do a real one, it seems doable. Just putting some glue on the back. That's yeah, it. it's, it's good. It's, am I, can you, okay. Yeah, it's good to have like a conclusion to a project. One of the things that I've definitely worked with, worked on over the years is like, you've got to say, this is done enough, uh, is totally it. And you've totally got some things that I, that they are very much what I would have considered done enough. You've done some great work. So be, be encouraged, know that you're doing great things. And then if there's anything to help support with the plant stand, uh, we're in. So, uh, any Anna, you're you're um, you're visible there. Would you like to share next? Okay. Um, so I said I was going to make a belt, and Aaron very kindly gave me one of his empty air like compressed air canisters that he uses for pink people, and it was completely empty. Um, I screwed off the pin valve on the top, and then the idea was that I was going to cut through the tank and keep the tank shape as my bell shape, um, and then figure out how to hang a knocker inside. Um, so then I got badged on the vertical and horizontal bandsaw, uh, just because I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to use the horizontal bandsaw, so I wanted to be badged on the vertical just in case. Turns out I can't really use the vertical one anyways because I'm too short to use it. Even with the ladder, I feel like I don't have, like standing on the ladder, I don't feel like I have a lot of control. Um, and I would have to make a jig in order to get a straight cut across it and keep the, the tube shape from moving around. Um, so this is what I did on the horizontal. So I basically just, cut the bottom off that that actually looks really great like it's a, a nice clean cut like it's a really good um like it's a really good setup i think that you're you're well on your way to having a bell the only the thing way is way is, is um, um the horizontal bandsaw band there's, there's a, a two, two plates, plates that you, that put, you put material, material on, on and it and levels, levels them so you get a get straight, straight like a straight cut, mm -hmm. but because this is so short, it was only sitting on one of the plates. So it's actually kind of not perfectly straight. And I wanted to do another horizontal. I just wanted to cut it again to get it to be straight, but it's too short now. So I have to figure out another way to do that. Oh, gotcha. Um, yeah, I wonder if you could, you could like tie it down to a sled that would be on both of those things. Like if you could, somehow brace it so that it would sit across both of them. Or if you just wanted to flatten it, if you could just like go on the belt grinder and just grind it until it was flat. So I was looking into that. There's no way to guarantee that'll be flat without a fence. Yeah, it's, there's, um, you're right, but there's, you can get pretty close with just using the shelf and like keeping the whole body flat on the shelf making sure that that's 90 degrees from the, the belt itself. So that when you're like rolling it, it's always in contact with the bottom and then up against the belt. 
the belt should remove pretty much perpendicular. It's not going to be as good as like a, a joiner would be for wood, but it's going to be close enough that you probably wouldn't be able to tell that it's not straight. Yeah. My issue is I, I happen to be in a relationship with a precision, a precision industrial <laughs> designer. Yeah. So as soon as I showed this to him, he was like, this is how you can fix it. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> and I was like, can I well, get close? <laughs> yeah, we, uh, yeah. And, and you got, that's, that's for you to decide how much you want to go after that. Or if it's just yeah. like a, fine, this is my work. I'm doing it. You, you know, you decide the dynamic that you want to have and then you go for it. I feel like there's some relationship decision buried in there too. <laughs> oh no, absolutely. I have to like, I was asking him for help, but there's a certain point where I have to be like, okay, thank you. I'm going to go do my own thing now. Yeah. Um, yeah. This is also kind of cool. Uh, I wire wheeled off some of the paint. Um, I'm trying to get into the camera here. And so this is how I was trying to tell whether or not it was aluminum. Oh yeah, and so when but, cut off, is it like definitely aluminum or is it steel or? Oh yeah, or no, the, it's fully aluminum. Gotcha. It's this, it's like really thick. Oh yeah, look at that. I wouldn't have guessed it to be that. I don't know thick. if you can hear the sound it makes. Hold on. It's yeah. very kinky right now because I'm I have no way to like hang it. Oh yeah. That sounds really good though. Yeah. It's got a good sound for being aluminum. Um, all right, so let's see. Just looking through my view got, I'd switch my view. So I think we got, did everybody got, um, everybody who's on the call got a chance to share. Sounds like it's lots of fun. Um, and it, it also sounded like people sort of knew where they were going for next week. Kate, did you, did you share what you were? Did you share what you were doing? Um, I didn't. I can share quickly. Um, I'm. I, I love the plant stand thing, which I think is what I'm actually making. I've been calling it a table. It's, <laughs> but um, it's a very small. Whatever. It doesn't matter. I'm making. I'm gonna try to weld something with legs that stands up, with wood on top of it. Um, I can show you real quick, basically, if it allows me to share. Um, yeah, are we doing that? Thinking about it. Um, this is my, um, so but basically this week was all about getting badges. Um, I got a whole bunch of badges. It was very exciting. Um, and I got to play with Sparks, which was really, really fun. Highly recommend the angled grinder. Um, it feels really cool. Um, I did some, some bad welds and some slightly better welds and got to wear fun outfits. So um, that was pretty much it. <laughs> <laughs> that was my week in um in metal exploration was just kind of learning stuff and trying stuff out um but it was also really cool because i'd been wanting to get into the metal shop but had been you know intimidated by the different tools and didn't really have a project and i've really enjoyed just having this excuse to say nope i'm gonna have to learn welding this week and definitely the horizontal dance on my new best friend was really cool um and so I would say, like the those are some of my favorites. I would I would recommend them um, to get in there. It was really fun. Um, oh, and to go, to, um, to go back to Lila's point, I am um, I'm, I may need to challenge you for the queen of not finishing things, and that's been like one of my biggest things. And most of my blog posts talk about this, about how I have never finished projects, and that's something that I've really enjoyed trying to pushing myself for for this class is just finish it one way or another and get it to a point um because i i never i wouldn't i wouldn't put the final glaze on it i would never like i would never do those final steps i have a sweater and the sleeves are still not attached so um one thought i don't know what is going to happen with covid and the schedules and and all that kind of stuff but one thing that we might want to consider as a class at some point is doing kind of a catch-up week um where you back and yeah. put finishing revisions on the past projects. Yeah, no, that that's totally a great a great suggestion, especially if we hit COVID times. Like if they ever, you know, if they ever say we're shutting down, that would be completely the thing to do. Um, also, next week is going to be focused on ideas and projects. So we're going to talk about how to set up your projects in ways that are a little bit more friendly 
towards getting you something so that any point if you have to stop, you've got a plan at least so that you should have something that's kind of finished, right? And it's never, it never quite works out that way, but that you've, you follow a spiral design pattern so that as you're designing and building, maybe more for a larger project, you get something where at any point, if you have to stop, it's, it's good enough. Um, and so those are, those are interesting strategies that we'll explore. Also, next week we might um, be building lamps if you want to, like optionally. I'll, I'll put out just like some instructions basically since it's gonna be about ideas. So, you know, building lamps with ideas, like light bulb going off. That's kind of a fun, a, kind of a fun punny project. Uh, so those are, those are all good things to, to think about. Um, but that, that brings us to where we're headed next week a little bit too. I, just before we uh, finish up, I, I just wanted to put a, a word in for like um, like other ways of thinking about working with metal, um, which is like this. Uh, I think people think of metal as like this very solid, hard, immovable thing, which like sometimes it is, um, but. Uh, I think it's also like, you can also think of it as something that even in its solid form, like, uh, has a kind of liquidy feel to it and like, uh, like it flows. Um, and because of the grain structure in it. So like, yeah, there's a lot of stuff to do like, um, with, you know, milling and welding and, and stuff that feels really, really uh solid um but you can really like change the shape of pieces of metal uh in ways that like before you do it uh, are hard to imagine and i don't know it's like i i i like thinking about it as something that's like uh it's like it has like a liquid quality to it um this this was uh as this started this was one sing, single re, uh rectangular piece of sheet metal um and just through like some hammering basically you you can turn things into a lot uh so don't guess there's there's a way that like you know coming from wood, we emphasize like how much harder metal is, but also like you can't fold and hammer wood and change its shape that way. It doesn't flow, um, but metal is something that can. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a fantastic point, Ada. Uh, thank you. The, the plasticity, like flowiness of metal is something that may feel like it's like it's tough to get to because metal is like you said definitionally hard but it's also one of its strengths that you can bend it and shape it and and do all that work with it yeah, yeah like and it's much harder than wood and in many ways it's not even if like you know as a physical measurement of hardness it's harder but like yeah you, you just you can't the, that ductility is um, something that is really fun, and I highly recommend to anyone who's just playing around to like play with that. Yeah, absolutely, T uh, totally. And I think that there's no, um, we should not, I should not even try to one up that advice. It's completely what you should all try and do. Try and try and bend and play with metal. There's lots of interesting things to try this week, and I want to encourage you all to just keep going and then try to push yourselves to try a new perspective on metal this week, because there's lots of ways to go deeper with it. Um, you should totally give it a look, give it a try, but um, I think we should call it. It's 9.30 right now, so we've had a full two and a half hours uh, of talking about metal and then how to make those changes and how to make those moves, so we'll be good, and then we'll have our week next week about ideas and then maybe we'll think about over the holidays having a catch-up week for covid or whatever so we'll take a look at where we're at where we're going um if 
for some, if we may do an all remote class where I'm at home and you're all at home, that might happen next week. We'll push it through. We'll talk about, I'm going to talk it over with JR, see what makes the most sense. And then we'll, we'll go from there. I'll be in touch over the course of the week. And then Thursday is still the tentative plan for office hours, but it might be Thursday and another weekend day where we try and split it up so that we're not all here at the same place in the same time. Because there are 10 of us, you know, and that's, that's a fairly large group. Good if we can split it up. So uh, I'll keep you posted. I'll be messaging. And it's, it's great to see all of you. And I'm glad that we have a recording for the couple of people who can be here. So have a great week, everybody. Stay safe and healthy. See ya.